The mystery of the Egyptian royal rings, Smith and the Pharaohs, an esoteric story by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter 1. Scientists, or some scientists, for occasionally one learned person differs from other learned persons, tell us they know all that is worth knowing about man, which statement, of course, includes woman. They trace him from his remotest origin. They show us how his bones changed and his shape modified. Also how, under the influence of his needs and passions, his intelligence developed from something very humble. They demonstrate conclusively that there is nothing in man which the dissecting table will not explain, that his aspirations towards another life have their root in the fear of death, or, say others of them, in that of earthquake or thunder, that his affinities with the past are merely inherited from remote ancestors who lived in that past, perhaps a million years ago, and that everything noble about him is but the fruit of expediency, or of a veneer of civilization, while everything base must be attributed to the instincts of his dominant and primeval nature. Man, in short, is an animal who, like every other animal, is finally subdued by his environment and takes his colour from his surroundings, as cattle do from the red soil of Devon. Such are the facts they, or some of them, declare. All the rest is rubbish. At times we are inclined to agree with these sages, especially after it has been our privilege to attend a course of lectures by one of them. Then, perhaps, something comes within the range of our experience which gives us pause and causes doubts, the old divine doubts, to arise again deep in our hearts, and with them a yet diviner hope. Perchance when all is said, so we think to ourselves, man is something more than an animal. Perchance he has known the past, the far past, and will know the future, the far, far future. Perchance the dream is true, and he does indeed possess what for convenience is called an immortal soul that may manifest itself in one shape or another, that may sleep for ages, but waking or sleeping still remains itself indestructible as the matter of the universe. An incident in the career of Mr. James Ebenezer Smith might well occasion such reflections were any acquainted with its details, which until this, its setting forth, was not the case. Mr. Smith is a person who knows when to be silent. Still, undoubtedly, it gave cause for thought to one individual, namely, to him to whom it happened. Indeed, James Ebenezer Smith is still thinking over it, thinking very hard indeed. J. Smith was well-born and well-educated. When he was a good-looking and able young man at college, but before he had taken his degree, trouble came to him, the particulars of which do not matter, and he was thrown penniless, also friendless, upon the rocky bosom of the world. No, not quite friendless, for he had a godfather, a gentleman connected with business whose Christian name was Ebenezer. To him, as a last resource, Smith went, feeling that Ebenezer owed him something in return for the awful appellation wherewith he had been endowed in baptism. To a certain extent, Ebenezer recognized the obligation. He did nothing heroic, but he found his godson a clerkship in a bank of which he was one of the directors, a modest clerkship no more. Also, when he died a year later, he left him a hundred pounds to be spent upon some souvenir. Smith, being of a practical turn of mind, instead of adorning himself with memorial jewellery for which he had no use, invested the hundred pounds in an exceedingly promising speculation. As it happened, he was not misinformed, and his talent returned to him multiplied by ten. He repeated the experiment, and being in a position to know what he was doing, with considerable success. By the time that he was thirty, he found himself possessed of a fortune of something over twenty-five thousand pounds. Then, and this shows the wise and practical nature of the man, he stopped speculating and put out his money in such a fashion that it brought him a safe and clear four per cent. By this time Smith, being an excellent man of business, was well up in the service of his bank, as yet only a clerk, it is true, but one who drew his four hundred pounds a year 
with prospects. In short, he was in a position to marry had he wished to do so. As it happened, he did not wish, perhaps because being very friendless, no lady who attracted him crossed his path, perhaps for other reasons. Shy and reserved in temperament, he confided only in himself. None, not even his superiors at the bank or the board of management, knew how well off he had become. No one visited him at the flat, which he was understood to occupy somewhere in the neighborhood of Putney. He belonged to no club and possessed not a single intimate. The blow which the world had dealt him in his early days, the harsh repulses and the rough treatment he had then experienced, sank so deep into his sensitive soul that never again did he seek close converse with his kind. In fact, while still young, he fell into a condition of old bachelorhood of a refined type. Soon, however, Smith discovered, it was after he had given up speculating, that a man must have something to occupy his mind. He tried philanthropy, but found himself too sensitive for a business which so often resolves itself into rude inquiry as to the affairs of other people. After a struggle, therefore, he compromised with his conscience by setting aside a liberal portion of his income for anonymous distribution among deserving persons and objects. While still in this vacant frame of mind, Smith chanced one day, when the bank was closed, to drift into the British Museum, more to escape the vile weather that prevailed without than for any other reason. Wandering hither and thither at hazard, he found himself in the great gallery devoted to Egyptian stone objects and sculpture. The place bewildered him somewhat, for he knew nothing of Egyptology. Indeed, there remained upon his mind only a sense of wonderment, not unmixed with awe. It must have been a great people, he thought to himself, that executed these works, and with the thought came a desire to know more about them. Yet he was going away when suddenly his eye fell on the sculptured head of a woman which hung upon the wall. Smith looked at it once, twice, thrice, and at the third look he fell in love. Needless to say, he was not aware that such was his condition. He knew only that a change had come over him, and never, never could he forget the face which that carven mask portrayed. Perhaps it was not really beautiful, save for its wondrous and mystic smile, Perhaps the lips were too thick and the nostrils too broad. Yet to him that face was beauty itself, beauty which drew him as with a cart rope and awoke within him all kinds of wonderful imaginings, some of them so strange and tender that almost they partook of the nature of memories. He stared at the image, and the image smiled back sweetly at him, as doubtless it, or rather its original, for this was but a plaster cast, had smiled at nothingness in some tomb or hiding hole for over thirty centuries, and as the woman whose likeness it was had once smiled upon the world. A short, stout gentleman bustled up, and in tones of authority addressed some workmen who were arranging a base for a neighbouring statue. It occurred to Smith that he must be someone who knew about these objects. Overcoming his natural diffidence with an effort, he raised his hat, and asked the gentleman if he could tell him who was the original of the mask. The official, who in fact was a very great man in the museum, glanced at Smith shrewdly, and seeing that his interest was genuine, answered, I don't know. Nobody knows. She has been given several names, but none of them have authority. Perhaps one day the rest of the statue may be found, and then we shall learn, that is, if it is inscribed, most likely, however, it has been burnt for lime long ago. Lord Quo, then you can't tell me anything about her, said Smith. Well, only a little. To begin with, that's a cast. The original is in the Cairo Museum. Mariette found it, I believe, at Karnak, and gave it a name after his fashion. Probably she was a queen of the 18th dynasty by the work. But you can see her rank for yourself from the broken Uraeus. Smith did not stop him to explain that he had not the faintest idea what a Uraeus might be, seeing that he was utterly unfamiliar with the snake-headed crest of Egyptian royalty. You should go to Egypt and study the head for yourself. It is one of the most beautiful things that ever was found. Well, I must be off. Good day. And he bustled down the long gallery. Smith found his way upstairs and looked at mummies and other things. 
Somehow it hurt him to reflect that the owner of yonder sweet, alluring face must have become a mummy long, long before the Christian era. Mummies did not strike him as attractive. He returned to the statuary and stared at his plaster cast, till one of the workmen remarked to his fellow that if he were the gent, he'd go and look at Aliven for a change. Then Smith retired abashed. On his way home, he called at his booksellers and ordered all the best works on Egyptology. When, a day or two later, they arrived in a packing case, together with a bill for thirty-eight pounds, he was somewhat dismayed. Still, he tackled those books like a man, and being clever and industrious, within three months had a fair working knowledge of the subject, and had even picked up a smattering of hieroglyphics. In January, that was, at the end of those three months, Smith astonished his board of directors by applying for ten weeks' leave, he who had hitherto been content with a fortnight in the year. When questioned, he explained that he had been suffering from bronchitis and was advised to take a change in Egypt. A very good idea, said the manager, but I'm afraid you'll find it expensive. They fleece one in Egypt. I know, answered Smith but I've saved a little and have only myself to spend it upon. So Smith went to Egypt and saw the original of the beauteous head and a thousand other fascinating things. Indeed, he did more. Attaching himself to some excavators who were glad of his intelligent assistance, he actually dug for a month in the neighborhood of ancient Thebes, but without finding anything in particular. It was not till two years later that he made his great discovery, that which is known as Smith's tomb. Here, it may be explained that the state of his health had become such as to necessitate an annual visit to Egypt, or so his superiors understood. However, as he asked for no summer holiday, and was always ready to do another man's work or to stop overtime, he found it easy to arrange for these winter excursions. On this, his third visit to Egypt, Smith obtained from the Director General of Antiquities at Cairo a license to dig upon his own account. Being already well known in the country as a skilled Egyptologist, this was granted upon the usual terms, namely that the Department of Antiquities should have a right to take any of the objects which might be found, or all of them if it's so desired. Such preliminary matters having been arranged by correspondence, Smith, after a few days spent in the museum at Cairo, took the night train to Luxor, where he found his headman, an ex-dragoman named Mahomet, waiting for him and his fellaheen laborers already hired. There were but forty of them, for his was a comparatively small venture. Three hundred pounds was the amount that he had made up his mind to expend, and such a sum does not go far in excavations. During his visit of the previous year, Smith had marked the place where he meant to dig. It was in the cemetery of old Thebes, at the wild spot not far from the temple of Medinet Habu, that is known as the Valley of the Queens. Here, separated from the resting places of their royal lords by the bold mass of the intervening hill, some of the greatest ladies of Egypt have been laid to rest, and it was their tombs that Smith desired to investigate. As he knew well, some of these must yet remain to be discovered. Who could say? Fortune favors the bold. It might be that he would find the holy grave of that beauteous, unknown royalty whose face had haunted him for three long years. For a whole month he dug without the slightest success. The spot that he selected had proved indeed to be the mouth of a tomb. After twenty-five days of laborious exploration, it was at length cleared out, and he stood in a rude, unfinished cave. The queen for whom it had been designed must have died quite young and been buried elsewhere, or she had chosen herself another sepulchre, or mayhap the rock had proved unsuitable for sculpture. Smith shrugged his shoulders and moved on, sinking trial pits and trenches here and there, but still finding nothing. Two-thirds of his time and money had been spent when at last the luck turned. One day, towards evening, with some half-dozen of his best men, he was returning after a fruitless morning of labor when something seemed to attract him towards a little wadi, or bay, in the hillside that was filled with tumbled rocks and sand. There were scores of such places, and this one looked no more promising than any of the others had proved to be. 
yet it attracted him. Thoroughly dispirited, he walked past it twenty paces or more, then turned. Where go you, sir? asked his headman, Mahomet. He pointed to the recess in the cliff. No good, sir, said Mahomet. No tomb there, bedrock too near top, too much water run in there, dead queen like keep dry. But Smith went on, and the others followed obediently. He walked down the little slope of sand and boulders and examined the cliff. It was virgin rock. Never a tool mark was to be seen. Already the men were going, when the same strange instinct which had drawn him to the spot caused him to take a spade from one of them and begin to shovel away the sand from the face of the cliff. For here, for some unexplained reason, were no boulders or debris. Seeing their master, to whom they were attached at work, they began to work too, and for twenty minutes or more dug on cheerfully enough, just to humour him, since all were sure that here there was no tomb. At length Smith ordered them to desist, for, although now they were six feet down, the rock remained of the same virgin character. With an exclamation of disgust, he threw out a last shovelful of sand. The edge of his spade struck on something that projected. He cleared away a little more sand, and there appeared a rounded ledge which seemed to be a cornice. Calling back the men, he pointed to it, and without a word all of them began to dig again. Five minutes more of work made it clear that it was a cornice, and half an hour later there appeared the top of the doorway of a tomb. Old people wall him up, said Mahomet, pointing to the flat stones set in mud for mortar with which the doorway had been closed, and to the undecipherable impress upon the mud of the scarab seals of the officials, whose duty it had been to close the last resting place of the royal dead forever. Perhaps Queen all right inside he went on, receiving no answer to his remark. Perhaps, replied Smith briefly. Dig, man, dig. Don't waste time in talking. So they dug on furiously, till at length Smith saw something which caused him to groan aloud. There was a hole in the masonry. The tomb had been broken into. Mahomet saw it too, and examined the top of the aperture with his skilled eye. Very old thief, he said. Look, he try build up wall again, but run away before he have time finish. And he pointed to certain flat stones which had been roughly and hurriedly replaced. Dig, dig, said Smith. Ten minutes more and the aperture was cleared. It was only just big enough to admit the body of a man. By now the sun was setting. Swiftly, swiftly, it seemed to tumble down the sky. One minute it was above the rough crests of the western hills behind them, the next, a great ball of glowing fire, it rested on their topmost ridge. Then it was gone. For an instant a kind of green spark shone where it had been. This too went out, and the sudden Egyptian night was upon them. The fellaheen muttered among themselves, and one or two of them wandered off on some pretext. The rest threw down their tools and looked at Smith. Men say they no like stop here. They are afraid of ghost. Too many a freet live in these tomb. That what they say. Come back, finish tomorrow morning when it light. Very foolish people, these common fellaheen, remarked Mahomet in a superior tone. Quite so, replied Smith, who knew well that nothing that he could offer would tempt his men to go on with the opening of a tomb after sunset. Let them go away. You and I will stop and watch the place till morning. Sorry, sir, said Mahomet, but I not feel quite well inside. Think I got fever. I go to camp and lie down and pray under plenty blanket. All right, go, said Smith. But if there is anyone who is not a coward, let him bring me my big coat, something to eat and drink, and the lantern that hangs in my tent. I will meet him there in the valley. Mahomet, though rather doubtfully, promised that this should be done, and, after begging Smith to accompany them, lest the spirit of whoever slept in the tomb should work him a mischief during the night, they departed quickly enough. Smith lit his pipe, sat down on the sand, and waited. Half an hour later he heard a sound of singing, and through the darkness, which was dense, saw lights coming up the valley. My brave men, he thought to himself, and scrambled up the slope to meet them. 
He was right. These were his men, no less than twenty of them, for with a fewer number they did not dare to face the ghosts which they believed haunted the valley after nightfall. Presently, the light from the lantern which one of them carried, not Mahomet, whose sickness had increased too suddenly to enable him to come, fell upon the tall form of Smith, who dressed in his white working clothes was leaning against a rock. Down went the lantern, and with a howl of terror the brave company turned and fled. Sons of cowards, roared Smith after them in his most vigorous Arabic. It is I, your master, not an afreet. They heard, and by degrees crept back again. Then he perceived that in order to account for their number, each of them carried some article. Thus, one had the bread, another the lantern, another a tin of sardines, another the sardine opener, another a box of matches, another a bottle of beer, and so on. As even thus there were not enough things to go round, two of them bore his big coat between them, the first holding it by the sleeves, and the second by the tail as though it were a stretcher. Put them down, said Smith, and they obeyed. Now, he added, run for your lives. I thought I heard two afreets talking up there just now of what they would do to any followers of the prophet who mock their gods if perchance they should meet them in their holy place at night. This kindly counsel was accepted with much eagerness. In another minute, Smith was alone with the stars and the dying desert wind. Collecting his goods, or as many of them as he wanted, he thrust them into the pockets of the greatcoat and returned to the mouth of the tomb. Here he made his simple meal by the light of the lantern and afterwards tried to go to sleep, but sleep he could not. Something always woke him. First it was a jackal howling amongst the rocks, next a sand fly bit him in the ankle so sharply that he thought he must have been stung by a scorpion. Then, notwithstanding his warm coat, the cold got hold of him, for the clothes beneath were wet through with perspiration, and it occurred to him that unless he did something, he would probably contract an internal chill or perhaps fever. He rose and walked about. By now the moon was up, revealing all the sad, wild scene in its every detail. The mystery of Egypt entered his soul and oppressed him. How much dead majesty lay in the hill upon which he stood? Were they all really dead, he wondered, or were those fellaheen right? Did their spirits still come forth at night and wander through the land where once they ruled? Of course, that was the Egyptian faith according to which the Ka, or double, eternally haunted the place where its earthly counterpart had been laid to rest. When one came to think of it, beneath a mass of unintelligible symbolism, there was much in the Egyptian faith which it was hard for a Christian to disbelieve. Salvation through a Redeemer, for instance, and the resurrection of the body. Had he, Smith, not already written a treatise upon these points of similarity which he proposed to publish one day, not under his own name? Well, he would not think of them now. The occasion seemed scarcely fitting. They came home too pointedly to one who was engaged in violating a tomb. His mind, or rather his imagination, of which he had plenty, went off at a tangent. What sights had this place seen thousands of years ago? Once, thousands of years ago, a procession had wound up along the roadway, which was doubtless buried beneath the sand, whereon he stood towards the dark door of this sepulchre. He could see it as it passed in and out between the rocks. The priests, shaven-headed and robed in leopard skins, or some of them in pure white, bearing the mystic symbols of their office. The funeral sledge drawn by oxen, and on it, the great rectangular case that contained the outer and the inner coffins, and within them the mummy of some departed majesty. In the Egyptian formula, the hawk that had spread its wings and flown into the bosom of Osiris, god of death. Behind, the mourners, rending the air with their lamentations. Then, those who bore the funeral furniture and offerings. Then the high officers of state and the first priests of Amen and of the other gods. Then the sister queens, leading by the hand a wandering child or two. Then the sons of Pharaoh, young men carrying the emblems of their rank. 
Lastly, walking alone, Pharaoh himself in his ceremonial robes, his apron, his double crown of linen surmounted by the golden snake, his inlaid bracelets, and his heavy, tinkling earrings. Pharaoh, his head bowed, his feet travelling wearily, and in his heart, what thoughts? Sorrow, perhaps, for her who had departed. Yet he had other queens and fair women without count. Doubtless she was sweet and beautiful, but sweetness and beauty were not given to her alone. Moreover, was she not wont to cross his will and to question his divinity? No, surely it is not only of her that he thinks, her for whom he had prepared this splendid tomb with all things needful to unite her with the gods. Surely he thinks also of himself and that other tomb on the farther side of the hill, whereat the artists labour day by day, yes, and have laboured these many years, that tomb to which before so very long he too must travel in just this fashion to seek his place beyond the doors of death, who lays his equal hand on king and queen and slave. The vision passed. It was so real that Smith thought he must have been dreaming. Well, he was awake now, and colder than ever. Moreover, the jackals had multiplied. There were a whole pack of them, and not far away. Look! One crossed in the ring of the lamplight, a slinking yellow beast that smelt the remains of dinner, or perhaps it smelt himself. Moreover, there were bad characters who haunted these mountains, and he was alone and quite unarmed. Perhaps he ought to put out the light which advertised his whereabouts. It would be wise, and yet in this particular he rejected wisdom. After all, the light was some company. Since sleep seemed to be out of the question, he fell back upon poor humanity's other anodyne, work, which has the incidental advantage of generating warmth. Seizing a shovel, he began to dig at the doorway of the tomb, whilst the jackals howled louder than ever in astonishment. They were not used to such a sight. For thousands of years, as the old moon above could have told, no man, or at least no solitary man, had dared to rob tombs at such an unnatural hour. When Smith had been digging for about twenty minutes, something tinkled on his shovel with a noise which sounded loud in that silence. A stone which may come in handy for the jackals, he thought to himself, shaking the sand slowly off the spade until it appeared. There it was, and not large enough to be of much service. Still, he picked it up and rubbed it in his hands to clear off the encrusting dirt. When he opened them, he saw that it was no stone, but a bronze. Osiris, reflected Smith, buried in front of the tomb to hallow the ground. No, an Isis. No, the head of a statuette, and a jolly good one too. At any rate, in moonlight, seems to have been gilded. And reaching out for the lamp, he held it over the object. Another minute, and he found himself sitting at the bottom of the hole, lamp in one hand and statuette, or rather head, in the other. The Queen of the Mask, he gasped. The same, the same, by heavens, the very same. Oh, he could not be mistaken. There were the identical lips, a little thick and pouted, the identical nostrils, curved and quivering, but a little wide, the identical arched eyebrows and dreamy eyes set somewhat far apart. Above all, there was the identical alluring and mysterious smile. Only on this masterpiece of ancient art was set a whole crown of Urai surrounding the entire head. Beneath the crown and pressed back behind the ears was a full-bottomed wig or royal headdress, of which the ends descended to the breasts. The statuette, that having been gilt, remained quite perfect and uncorroded, was broken just above the middle, apparently by a single violent blow, for the fracture was very clean. At once it occurred to Smith that it had been stolen from the tomb by a thief who thought it to be gold, that outside of the tomb doubt had overtaken him and caused him to break it upon a stone or otherwise. The rest was clear. Finding that it was but gold-washed bronze, he had thrown away the fragments rather than be at the pains of carrying them. This was his theory, probably not a correct one, as the sequel seems to show. Smith's first idea was to recover the other portion. He searched quite a long while, but without success. Neither then nor afterwards could it be found. 
he reflected that perhaps this lower half had remained in the thief's hand, who, in his vexation, had thrown it far away, leaving the head to lie where it fell. Again, Smith examined this head, and more closely. Now he saw that just beneath the breasts was a delicately cut cartouche. Being by this time a master of hieroglyphics, he read it without trouble. It ran, Ma me, great royal lady, beloved of... Here, the cartouche was broken away. Ma me, or it might be Ma me, he reflected. I never heard of a queen called Ma me, or Ma me, or Ma mu. She must be quite new to history. I wonder of whom she was beloved. Amen, or Horus, or Isis, probably. Of some god, I have no doubt. At least I hope so. He stared at the beautiful portrait in his hand, as once he had stared at the cast on the museum wall, and the beautiful portrait, emerging from the dust of ages, smiled back at him there in the solemn moonlight, as once the cast had smiled from the museum wall. Only that had been but a cast, whereas this was real. This had slept with the dead from whose features it had been fashioned, the dead who lay, or who had lain, within. A sudden resolution took hold of Smith. He would explore that tomb, at once and alone. No one should accompany him on this his first visit. It would be a sacrilege that anyone save himself should set foot there until he had looked on what it might contain. Why should he not enter? His lamp, of what is called the Hurricane brand, was very good and bright, and would burn for many hours. Moreover, there had been time for the foul air to escape through the hole that they had cleared. Lastly, something seemed to call on him to come and see. He placed the bronze head in his breast pocket over his heart, and thrusting the lamp through the hole, looked down. Here there was no difficulty since sand had drifted in to the level of the bottom of the aperture. Through it, he struggled to find himself upon a bed of sand that only just left him room to push himself along between it and the roof. A little farther on the passage was almost filled with mud. Mahomet had been right when, from his knowledge of the bedrock, he said that any tomb made in this place must be flooded. It had been flooded by some ancient rainstorm, and Smith began to fear that he would find it quite filled with soil caked as hard as iron. So indeed, it was to a certain depth, a result that apparently had been anticipated by those who hollowed it, for this entrance shaft was left quite undecorated. Indeed, as Smith found afterwards, a hole had been dug beneath the doorway to allow the mud to enter after the burial was completed. Only a miscalculation had been made. The natural level of the mud did not quite reach the roof of the tomb, and therefore still left it open. After crawling for forty feet or so over this caked mud, Smith suddenly found himself on a rising stair. Then he understood the plan. The tomb itself was on a higher level. Here began the paintings. Here the Queen Mami, wearing her crowns and dressed in diaphanous garments, was presented to God after God. Between her figure and those of the divinities, the wall was covered with hieroglyphs as fresh today as on that when the artist had limbed them. A glance told him that they were extracts from the Book of the Dead. When the thief of bygone ages had broken into the tomb, probably not very long after the interment, the mud over which Smith had just crawled was still wet. This he could tell, since the clay from the rascal's feet remained upon the stairs, and that upon his fingers had stained the paintings on the wall against which he had supported himself. Indeed, in one place was an exact impression of his hand, showing its shape and even the lines of the skin. At the top of the flight of steps ran another passage at a higher level, which the water had never reached, and to right and left were the beginnings of unfinished chambers. It was clear to him that this queen had died young. Her tomb, as she or the king had designed it, was never finished. A few more paces, and the passage enlarged itself into a hall about thirty feet square. The ceiling was decorated with vultures, their wings outspread, the looped cross of life hanging from their talons. On one wall, Her Majesty Mami stood expectant while Anubis weighed her heart against the feather of truth, and Thoth, the recorder, wrote down the verdict upon his tablets. All her titles were given to her here, such as Great Royal Heiress, 
royal sister, royal wife, royal mother, lady of the two lands, palm branch of love, beautiful exceedingly. Smith read them hurriedly and noted that nowhere could he see the name of the king who had been her husband. It would almost seem as though this had been purposely omitted. On the other walls, Marmi, accompanied by her car or double, made offerings to the various gods or uttered propitiatory speeches to the hideous demons of the underworld, declaring their names to them and forcing them to say, Pass on, thou art pure. Lastly, on the end wall, triumphant, all her trials done, she, the justified Osiris, or spirit, was received by the god Osiris, saviour of spirits. All these things Smith noted hurriedly as he swung the lamp to and fro in that hallowed place. Then he saw something else which filled him with dismay. On the floor of the chamber where the coffins had been, for this was the burial chamber, lay a heap of black fragments charred with fire. Instantly he understood. After the thief had done his work, he had burned the mummy cases, and with them the body of the queen. There could be no doubt that this was so for look. Among the ashes lay some calcined human bones, while the roof above was blackened with the smoke and cracked by the heat of the conflagration. There was nothing left for him to find. Oppressed with the closeness of the atmosphere, he sat down upon a little bench or table cut in the rock that evidently had been meant to receive offerings to the dead. Indeed, on it still lay the scorched remains of some votive flowers. Here, his lamp between his feet, he rested a while, staring at those calcined bones. See, yonder was the lower jaw, and in it some teeth, small, white, regular, and but little worn. Yes, she had died young. Then he turned to go, for disappointment, and the holiness of the place overcame him. He could endure no more of it that night. Leaving the burial hall, he walked along the painted passage, the lamp swinging and his eyes fixed upon the floor. He was disheartened, and the paintings could wait till the morrow. He descended the steps and came to the foot of the mud slope. Here suddenly he perceived, projecting from some sand that had drifted down over the mud, what seemed to be the corner of a reed box or basket. To clear away the sand was easy, and, yes, it was a basket, a foot or so in length, such a basket as the old Egyptians used to contain the funeral figures which are called ushaptis, or other objects connected with the dead. It looked as though it had been dropped, for it lay upon its side. Smith opened it, not very hopefully, for surely nothing of value would have been abandoned thus. The first thing that met his eyes was a mummied hand, broken off at the wrist, a woman's little hand, most delicately shaped. It was withered and paper white, but the contours still remained. The long fingers were perfect, and the almond-shaped nails had been stained with henna, as was the embalmer's fashion. On the hand were two gold rings, and for those rings it had been stolen. Smith looked at it for a long while, and his heart swelled within him, for here was the hand of that royal lady of his dreams. Indeed, he did more than look. He kissed it, and as his lips touched the holy relic, it seemed to him as though a wind, cold but scented, blew upon his brow. Then, growing fearful of the thoughts that arose within him, he hurried his mind back to the world, or rather, to the examination of the basket. Here he found other objects roughly wrapped in fragments of mummy cloth that had been torn from the body of the queen. These it is needless to describe, for are they not to be seen in the gold room of the museum labelled Bijouterie de la Reine Marmée, des H.U.M. Dynasty, Thebes, Smith's tomb. It may be mentioned, however, that the set was incomplete. For instance, there was but one of the great gold ceremonial earrings fashioned like a group of pomegranate blooms, and the most beautiful of the necklaces had been torn in two. Half of it was missing. It was clear to Smith that only a portion of the precious objects which were buried with the mummy had been placed in this basket. Why had these been left where he found them? A little reflection made that clear also. Something had prompted the thief to destroy the desecrated body and its coffin with fire, probably in the hope of hiding his evil handiwork. 
Then he fled with his spoil, but he had forgotten how fiercely mummies and their trappings can burn. Or perhaps the thing was an accident. He must have had a lamp, and if its flame chanced to touch this bituminous tinder. At any rate, the smoke overtook the man in that narrow place as he began to climb the slippery slope of clay. In his haste, he dropped the basket and dared not return to search for it. It could wait till the morrow, when the fire would be out, and the air pure. Only for this desecrator of the royal dead that morrow never came, as was discovered afterwards. When at length Smith struggled into the open air, the stars were paling before the dawn. An hour later, after the sky was well up, Mahomet recovered from his sickness, and his myrmidons arrived. I have been busy while you slept, said Smith, showing them the mummied hand, but not the rings which he had removed from the shrunk fingers, and the broken bronze, but not the priceless jewellery which was hidden in his pockets. For the next ten days they dug, till the tomb and its approach were quite clear. In the sand, at the head of a flight of steps which led down to the doorway, they found the skeleton of a man, who evidently had been buried there in a hurried fashion. His skull was shattered by the blow of an axe, and the shaven scalp that still clung to it suggested that he might have been a priest. Mahomet thought, and Smith agreed with him, that this was the person who had violated the tomb. As he was escaping from it, the guards of the holy place surprised him after he had covered up the hole by which he had entered and purposed to return. There they executed him without trial and divided up the plunder thinking that no more was to be found, or perhaps his confederates killed him. Such at least were the theories advanced by Mahomet. Whether they were right or wrong, none will ever know. For instance, the skeleton may not have been that of the thief, though probability appears to point the other way. Nothing more was found in the tomb, not even a scarab or a mummy bead. Smith spent the remainder of his time in photographing the pictures and copying the inscriptions, which for various reasons proved to be of extraordinary interest. Then, having reverently buried the charred bones of the queen in a secret place of the sepulchre, he handed it over to the care of the local guardian of antiquities, paid off Mahomet and the Fellaheen, and departed for Cairo. With him went the wonderful jewels of which he had breathed no word, and another relic to him yet more precious, the hand of Her Majesty Mami, palm branch of love. And now follows the strange sequel of this story of Smith and the Queen Marmy. Chapter 2 Smith was seated in the sanctum of the Distinguished Director General of Antiquities at the New Cairo Museum. It was a very interesting room. Books piled upon the floor, objects from tombs awaiting examination, lying here and there, a hoard of Ptolemaic silver coins just dug up at Alexandria, standing on a table in the pot that had hidden them for two thousand years. In the corner, the mummy of a royal child, aged six or seven, not long ago discovered, with some inscription scrawled upon the wrappings, brought here to be deciphered by the master, and the withered lotus bloom, love's last offering, thrust beneath one of the pink retaining bands. A touching object, thought Smith to himself. Really? they might have left the dear little girl in peace. Smith had a tender heart, but even as he reflected, he became aware that some of the jewellery hidden in an inner pocket of his waistcoat, designed for banknotes, was fretting his skin. He had a tender conscience also. Just then the director, a French savant, bustled in, alert, vigorous, full of interest. Ah, my dear Mr. Smith, he said in his excellent English, I am indeed glad to see you back again, especially as I understand that you are come rejoicing and bringing your sheaves with you. They tell me you have been extraordinarily successful. What do you say is the name of this queen whose tomb you have found? Mami? A very unusual name. How do you get the extra vowel? Is it for euphony, eh? Did I not know how good a scholar you are? I should be tempted to believe that you had misread it. Me, me, Mami. That would be pretty in French, would it not? Ma me, my darling. Well, I dare say she was somebody's my in her time. But tell me the story. Smith told him shortly and clearly. Also, he produced his photographs and copies of inscriptions. 
This is interesting. Interesting, truly, said the director when he had glanced through them. You must leave them with me to study. Also, you will publish them, is it not so? Perhaps one of the societies would help you with the cost, for it should be done in facsimile. Look at this vignette. Most unusual. Oh, what a pity that scoundrelly priest got off with the jewellery and burnt Her Majesty's body. He didn't get off with all of it. What, Mr. Smith? Our inspector reported to me that you found nothing. I dare say, sir, but your inspector did not know what I found. Ah, you are a discreet man. Well, let us see. Slowly, Smith unbuttoned his waistcoat. From its inner pocket and elsewhere about his person, he extracted the jewels wrapped in mummy cloth as he had found them. First, he produced a scepter head of gold in the shape of a pomegranate fruit and engraved with the throne name and titles of Mami. What a beautiful object, said the director. Look, the handle was of ivory, and that sacred thief of a priest smashed it out at the socket. It was fresh ivory then. The robbery must have taken place not long after the burial. See, this magnifying glass shows it. Is that all? Smith handed him the surviving half of the marvellous necklace that had been torn in two. I have re-threaded it, he muttered, but every bead is in its place. Oh, heavens, how lovely! Note the cutting of those cornelian heads of Hathor and the gold lotus blooms between, yes, and the enamelled flies beneath. We have nothing like it in the museum. So it went on. Is that all? gasped the director at last, when every object from the basket glittered before them on the table. Yes, said Smith. That is, no. I found a broken statuette hidden in the sand outside the tomb. It is of the queen, but I thought perhaps you would allow me to keep this. But certainly, Mr. Smith, it is yours indeed. We are not niggards here. Still, if I might see it. From yet another pocket, Smith produced the head. The director gazed at it, then he spoke with feeling. I said just now that you were discreet, Mr. Smith, and I have been reflecting that you are honest, but now I must add that you are very clever. If you had not made me promise that this bronze should be yours before you showed it me, well, it would never have gone into that pocket again, and in the public interest, won't you release me from the promise? No, said Smith. You are perhaps not aware, went on the director with a groan, that this is a portrait of Mariette's unknown queen, whom we are thus able to identify. It seems a pity that the two should be separated, a replica we could let you have. I am quite aware, said Smith, and I will be sure to send you a replica with photographs. Also, I promise to leave the original to some museum by will. The director clasped the image tenderly, and holding it to the light, read the broken cartouche beneath the breasts. Ma May, great royal lady, beloved of... Beloved of whom? Well, of Smith, for one. Take it, monsieur, and hide it away at once, lest soon there should be another mummy in this collection, a modern mummy called Smith. And in the name of justice, let the museum which inherits it be not the British, but that of Cairo for this queen belongs to Egypt. By the way, I have been told that you are delicate in the lungs. How is your health now? Our cold winds are very trying. Quite good. Ah, that is excellent. I suppose that you have no more articles that you can show me. I have nothing more except a mummied hand, which I found in the basket with the jewels. The two rings off it lie there. Doubtless it was removed to get at that bracelet, I suppose you will not mind my keeping the hand. Of the beloved of Smith, interrupted the director drolly. No, I suppose not, though for my part I should prefer one that was not quite so old. Still, perhaps you will not mind my seeing it. That pocket of yours still looks a little bulky. I thought that it contained books. Smith produced a cigar box. In it was the hand wrapped in cotton wool. Ah! said the director, a pretty, well-bred hand. No doubt this Mami was the real heiress to the throne as she describes herself. The pharaoh was somebody of inferior birth, half-brother. She is called Royal Sister, you remember. Son of one of the pharaoh's slave women, perhaps. Odd that she never mentioned him in the tomb. 
It looks as though they didn't get on in life, and that she was determined to have done with him in death. Those were the rings upon that hand, were they not? He replaced them on the fingers, then took off one, a royal signet in a cartouche, and read the inscription on the other. Bees Ank, Ank Bees, Bees the Living, the Living Bees. Your mommy had some human vanity about her, he added. Bees, among other things, as you know, was the god of beauty and of the adornments of women. She wore that ring that she might remain beautiful and that her dresses might always fit and her rouge never cake when she was dancing before the gods. Also, it fixes her period pretty closely, but then so do other things. It seems a pity to rob Marmy of her pet ring, does it not? The royal signet will be enough for us. With a little bow, he gave the hand back to Smith leaving the bee's ring on the finger that had worn it for more than three thousand years. At least, Smith was so sure it was the bee's ring that at the time he did not look at it again. Then they parted, Smith promising to return upon the morrow, which, owing to events to be described, he did not do. Ah, said the master to himself as the door closed behind his visitor, he's in a hurry to be gone. He has fear lest I should change my mind about that ring. Also, there is the bronze. Monsieur Smith was ruse there. It is worth a thousand pounds, that bronze. Yet I do not believe he was thinking of the money. I believe he is in love with that Marmy and wants to keep her picture. Mon Dieu, a well-established affection. At least he is what the English call an odd fish, one whom I could never make out, and of whom no one seems to know anything. Still, honest, I am sure, quite honest. Why, he might have kept every one of those jewels and no one have been the wiser. And what things, what a find. Seal, what a find. There's been nothing like it for years. Benedictions on the head of Oddfish Smith. Then he collected the precious objects, thrust them into an inner compartment of his safe, which he locked and double-locked, and, as it was nearly five o'clock, departed from the museum to his private residence in the grounds, there to study Smith's copies and photographs, and to tell some friends of the great things that had happened. When Smith found himself outside the sacred door and had presented its venerable guardian with a backsheesh of five piastres, he walked a few paces to the right and paused a while to watch some native laborers who were dragging a huge sarcophagus upon an improvised tramway. As they dragged, they sang an echoing rhythmic song, whereof each line ended with an invocation to Allah. Just so, reflected Smith, had their forefathers sung when, millenniums ago, they dragged that very sarcophagus from the quarries to the Nile, and from the Nile to the tomb whence it reappeared today, or when they slid the casing blocks of the pyramids up the great causeway and smooth slope of sand, and laid them in their dizzy resting places. Only then, each line of the immemorial chant of toil ended with an invocation to Amen, now transformed to Allah. The East may change its masters and its gods, but its customs never change, and if today Allah wore the feathers of Amen, one wonders whether the worshippers would find the difference so very great. Thus thought Smith as he hurried away from the sarcophagus and those blue-robed, dark-skinned fellaheen down the long gallery that is filled with a thousand sculptures. For a moment he paused before the wonderful white statue of Queen Amenartas, then, remembering that his time was short, hastened on to a certain room, one of those which opened out of the gallery. In a corner of this room, upon the wall, amongst many other beautiful objects, stood that head which Mariette had found, whereof in past years the cast had fascinated him in London. Now he knew whose head it was. To him it had been given to find the tomb of her who had sat for that statue. Her very hand was in his pocket, yes, the hand that had touched yonder marble, pointing out its defects to the sculptor, or perhaps swearing that he flattered her. Smith wondered who that sculptor was. Surely he must have been a happy man. Also, he wondered whether the statuette was also this master's work. He thought so, but he wished to make sure. Near to the end of the room he stopped and looked about him like a thief. 
He was alone in the place. Not a single student or tourist could be seen, and its guardian was somewhere else. He drew out the box that contained the hand. From the hand, he slipped the ring which the director general had left there as a gift to himself. He would much have preferred the other with the signet, but how could he say so, especially after the episode of the statuette? Replacing the hand in his pocket without looking at the ring, for his eyes were watching to see whether he was observed, he set it upon his little finger, which it exactly fitted. Marmee had worn both of them upon the third finger of her left hand, the B.E.'s ring as a guard to the signet. He had the fancy to approach the effigy of Marmee, wearing a ring which she had worn, and that came straight from her finger to his own. Smith found the head in its accustomed place. Weeks had gone by since he looked upon it, and now, to his eyes, it had grown more beautiful than ever, and its smile was more mystical and living. He drew out the statuette and began to compare them point by point. Oh, no doubt was possible. Both were likenesses of the same woman, though the statuette might have been executed two or three years later than the statue. To him, the face of it looked a little older and more spiritual. Perhaps illness or some premonition of her end had then thrown its shadow on the queen. He compared and compared. He made some rough measurements and sketches in his pocketbook and set himself to work out a canon of proportions. So hard and earnestly did he work, so lost was his mind that he never heard the accustomed warning sound which announces that the museum is about to close. Hidden behind an altar as he was, in his distant, shadowed corner, the guardian of the room never saw him as he cast a last perfunctory glance about the place before departing till the Saturday morning. For the morrow was Friday, the Mohammedan Sabbath, on which the museum remained shut, and he would not be called upon to attend. So he went. Everybody went. The great doors clanged, were locked and bolted, and save for a watchman outside, no one was left in all that vast place except Smith in his corner, engaged in sketching and in measurements. The difficulty of seeing, owing to the increase of shadow, first called his attention to the fact that time was slipping away. He glanced at his watch and saw that it was ten minutes to the hour. Soon be time to go, he thought to himself, and resumed his work. How strangely silent the place seemed. Not a footstep to be heard or the sound of a human voice. He looked at his watch again and saw that it was six o'clock, not five or so the thing said. But that was impossible, for the museum shut at five. Evidently the desert sand had got into the works. The room in which he stood was that known as Room One and he had noticed that its Arab custodian often frequented room K or the gallery outside. He would find him and ask what was the real time. Passing round the effigy of the wonderful Hathor cow, perhaps the finest example of an ancient sculpture of a beast in the whole world, Smith came to the doorway and looked up and down the gallery. Not a soul to be seen. He ran to room K, to room H, and others. Still not a soul to be seen. Then he made his way as fast as he could go to the great entrance. The doors were locked and bolted. Watch must be right after all. I'm shut in, he said to himself. However, there's sure to be someone about somewhere. Probably the Salle de Vente is still open. Shops don't shut till they are obliged. Thither he went, to find its door as firmly closed as a door can be. He knocked on it, but a sepulchral echo was the only answer. I know, he reflected. The director must still be in his room. It will take him a long while to examine all that jewellery and put it away. So for the room he headed, and after losing his path twice, found it by help of the sarcophagus that the Arabs had been dragging, which now stood as deserted as it had done in the tomb, a lonesome and impressive object in the gathering shadows. The director's door was shut, and again his knockings produced nothing but an echo. He started on a tour round the museum, and having searched the ground floors, ascended to the upper galleries by the great stairway. Presently he found himself in that devoted to the royal mummies, and being tired, rested there a while. 
Opposite to him, in a glass case in the middle of the gallery, reposed Ramsi Saku. Near to, on shelves in a side case, were Ramesses's son, Menepta, and above, his son, Seti Saku, while in other cases were the mortal remains of many more of the royalties of Egypt. He looked at the proud face of Ramses and at the little fringe of white locks turned yellow by the embalmer's spices, also at the raised left arm. He remembered how the director had told him that when they were unrolling this mighty monarch, they went away to lunch, and that presently the man who had been left in charge of the body rushed into the room with his hair on end and said that the dead king had lifted his arm and pointed at him. Back they went, and there, true enough, was the arm lifted, nor were they ever able to get it quite into its place again. The explanation given was that the warmth of the sun had contracted the withered muscles, a very natural and correct explanation. Still, Smith wished that he had not recollected the story just at this moment, especially as the arm seemed to move while he contemplated it, a very little, but still to move. He turned round and gazed at Menepta, whose hollow eyes stared at him from between the wrappings carelessly thrown across the parchment-like and ashen face. There, probably, lay the countenance that had frowned on Moses. There was the heart which God had hardened. Well, it was hard enough now, for the doctors said he died of ossification of the arteries, and that the vessels of the heart were full of lime. Smith stood upon a chair and peeped at Seti Satu, above. His weaker countenance was very peaceful, but it seemed to wear an air of reproach. In getting down, Smith managed to upset the heavy chair. The noise it made was terrific. He would not have thought it possible that the fall of such an article could produce so much sound. Satisfied with his inspection of these particular kings, who somehow looked quite different now from what they had ever done before, more real and imminent, so to speak, he renewed his search for a living man. On he went, mummies to his right, mummies to his left, of every style and period, till he began to feel as though he never wished to see another dried remnant of mortality. He peeped into the room where lay the relics of Awiya and Tuiyu, the father and mother of the great Queen Tyre. Cloths had been drawn over these, and really they looked worse and more suggestive thus draped than in their frigid and unadorned blackness. He came to the coffins of the priest kings of the twentieth dynasty, formidable painted coffins with human faces. There seemed to be a vast number of these priest kings, but perhaps they were better than the gold masks of the great Ptolemaic ladies, which glinted at him through the gathering gloom. Really, he had seen enough of the upper floors. The statues downstairs were better than all these dead, although it was true that according to the Egyptian faith, every one of those statues was haunted eternally by the car or double of the person whom it represented. He descended the great stairway. Was it fancy, or did something run across the bottom step in front of him, an animal of some kind, followed by a swift moving and indefinite shadow? If so, it must have been the museum cat hunting a museum mouse. Only then, what on earth was that very peculiar and unpleasant shadow? He called, Puss! 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 For he would have been quite glad of its company, but there came no friendly meow in response. Perhaps it was only the car of a cat, and the shadow was, oh, never mind what. The Egyptians worshipped cats, and there were plenty of their mummies about on the shelves. But the shadow. Once he shouted in the hope of attracting attention, for there were no windows to which he could climb. He did not repeat the experiment, for it seemed as though a thousand voices were answering him from every corner and roof of the gigantic edifice. Well, he must face the thing out. He was shut in a museum, and the question was in what part of it he should camp for the night. Moreover, as it was growing rapidly dark, the problem must be solved at once. He thought with affection of the lavatory, where, before going to see the director, only that afternoon he had washed his hands with the assistance of a kindly Arab who watched the door and gracefully accepted a piaster. But there was no Arab there now, and the door, like every other in this confounded place, was locked. He marched on to the entrance. Here, opposite to each other, 
stood the red sarcophagi of the great Queen Hatshepu and her brother and husband, Thotmes the Third. He looked at them. Why should not one of these afford him a night's lodging? They were deep and quiet and would fit the human frame very nicely. For a while, Smith wondered which of these monarchs would be the more likely to take offence at such a use of a private sarcophagus, and acting on general principles, concluded that he would rather throw himself on the mercy of the lady. Already one of his legs was over the edge of that solemn coffer, and he was squeezing his body beneath the massive lid that was propped above it on blocks of wood, when he remembered a little, naked, withered thing with long hair that he had seen in a side chamber of the tomb of Amenhotep II, in the Valley of Kings at Thebes. This caricature of humanity many thought, and he agreed with them, to be the actual body of the mighty Hatshepu as it appeared after the robbers had done with it. Supposing now that when he was lying at the bottom of that sarcophagus, sleeping the sleep of the just, this little personage should peep over its edge and ask him what he was doing there. Of course, the idea was absurd. He was tired, and his nerves were a little shaken. Still, the fact remained that for centuries the hallowed dust of Queen Hatshepu had slept where he, a modern man, was proposing to sleep. He scrambled down from the sarcophagus and looked round him in despair. Opposite to the main entrance was the huge central hall of the museum. Now the cement roof of this hall had, he knew, gone wrong, with the result that very extensive repairs had become necessary. So extensive were they, indeed, that the director-general had informed him that they would take several years to complete. Therefore this hall was boarded up, only a little doorway being left by which the workmen could enter. Certain statues of Seti Saku, and others, too large to be moved, were also roughly boarded over, as were some great funeral boats on either side of the entrance. The rest of the place, which might be two hundred feet long with a proportionate breadth, was empty, save for the colossi of Amenhotep III, and his queen tyre that stood beneath the gallery at its farther end. It was an appalling place in which to sleep, but better, reflected Smith, than a sarcophagus or those mummy chambers. If, for instance, he could creep behind the deal boards that enclosed one of the funeral boats, he would be quite comfortable there. Lifting the curtain, he slipped into the hall, where the gloom of evening had already settled. Only the skylights and the outline of the towering colossi at the far end remained visible. Close to him were the two funeral boats which he had noted when he looked into the hall earlier on that day, standing at the head of a flight of steps which led to the sunk floor of the centre. He groped his way to that on the right. As he expected, the projecting planks were not quite joined at the bow. He crept in between them and the boat and laid himself down. Presumably, being altogether tired out, Smith did ultimately fall asleep for how long he never knew. At any rate, it is certain that, if so, he woke up again. He could not tell the time, because his watch was not a repeater, and the place was as black as the pit. He had some matches in his pocket, and might have struck one, and even have lit his pipe. To his credit be it said, however, he remembered that he was the sole tenant of one of the most valuable museums in the world, and his responsibilities with reference to fire so he refrained from striking that match under the keel of a boat which had become very dry in the course of five thousand years. Smith found himself very wide awake indeed. Never in all his life did he remember being more so, not even in the hour of its great catastrophe, or when his godfather, Ebenezer, after much hesitation, had promised him a clerkship in the bank of which he was a director. His nerves seemed strung tight as harp strings, and his every sense was painfully acute. Thus he could even smell the odour of mummies that floated down from the upper galleries and the earthy scent of the boat which had been buried for thousands of years in sand at the foot of the pyramid of one of the fifth dynasty kings. Moreover, he could hear all sorts of strange sounds, faint and far away sounds, which at first he thought must emanate from Cairo without. Soon, however, he grew sure that their origin was more local. Doubtless the cement work and the cases in the galleries were cracking audibly, as is the unpleasant habit of such things at night. 
Yet why should these common manifestations be so universal and affect him so strangely? Really, it seemed as though people were stirring all about him. More, he could have sworn that the great funeral boat beneath which he lay had become repeopled with the crew that once it bore. He heard them at their business above him. There were trampings and a sound as though something heavy were being laid on the deck, such, for instance, as must have been made when the mummy of Pharaoh was set there for its last journey to the western bank of the Nile. Yes, and now he could have sworn again that the priestly crew were getting out the oars. Smith began to meditate flight from the neighborhood of that place when something occurred which determined him to stop where he was. The huge hall was growing light, but not, as at first he hoped, with the rays of dawn. This light was pale and ghostly, though very penetrating. Also, it had a blue tinge, unlike any other he had ever seen. At first it arose in a kind of fan or fountain at the far end of the hall, illumining the steps there and the two noble colossi which sat above. But what was this that stood at the head of the steps, radiating glory? By heavens! It was Osiris himself, or the image of Osiris, god of the dead, the Egyptian saviour of the world. There he stood, in his mummy cloths, wearing the feathered crown, and holding in his hands, which projected from an opening in the wrappings, the crook and the scourge of power. Was he alive, or was he dead? Smith could not tell, since he never moved, only stood there, splendid and fearful, his calm, benignant face staring into nothingness. Smith became aware that the darkness between him and the vision of this god was peopled, that a great congregation was gathering, or had gathered there. The blue light began to grow, long tongues of it shot forward, which joined themselves together, illumining all that huge hall. Now, too, he saw the congregation. Before him, rank upon rank of them, stood the kings and queens of Egypt. As though at a given signal, they bowed themselves to the Osiris, and ere the tinkling of their ornaments had died away, lo, Osiris was gone. But in his place stood another, Isis, the mother of mystery, her deep eyes looking forth from beneath the jeweled vulture cap. Again the congregation bowed, and lo, she was gone. But in her place stood yet another, a radiant, lovely being, who held in her hand the sign of life, and wore upon her head the symbol of the shining disc, Hathor, goddess of love. A third time the congregation bowed, and she too was gone, nor did any other appear in her place. The pharaohs and their queens began to move about and speak to each other. Their voices came to his ears in one low, sweet murmur. In his amaze, Smith had forgotten fear. From his hiding place he watched them intently. Some of them he knew by their faces. There, for instance, was the long-necked Kuenaten, talking somewhat angrily to the imperial Rameses too. Smith could understand what he said, for this power seemed to have been given to him. He was complaining in a high, weak voice that on this, the one night of the year when they might meet, the gods, or the magic images of the gods who were put up for them to worship, should not include his god, symbolized by the Aten, or the sun's disc. I have heard of your majesty's god, replied Rameses. The priests used to tell me of him, also that he did not last long after your majesty flew to heaven. The fathers of Amen gave you a bad name. They called you the heretic and hammered out your cartouches. They were quite rare in my time. Oh, do not let your majesty be angry. So many of us have been heretics. My grandson, Seti, there, and he pointed to a mild, thoughtful-faced man. For example, I am told that he really worshipped the god of those Hebrew slaves whom I used to press to build my cities. Look at that lady with him. Beautiful, isn't she? Observe her large, violet eyes. Well, she was the one who did the mischief, a Hebrew herself. At least they tell me so. I will talk with him, answered Kuenaten. It is more than possible that we may agree on certain points. Meanwhile, let me explain to your majesty. Oh, I pray you, not now. There is my wife. Your wife, said Kuenaten, drawing himself up. 
Which wife? I am told that your majesty had many and left a large family. Indeed, I see some hundreds of them here tonight. Now I... But let me introduce Nefertiti to your majesty. I may explain that she was my only wife. So I have understood. Your majesty was rather an invalid, were you not? Of course, in those circumstances, one prefers the nurse whom one can trust. Oh, pray, no offence. Nefertari, my love. Oh, I beg pardon. Astnefert, Nefertari has gone to speak to some of her children. Let me introduce you to your predecessor, the Queen Nefertiti, wife of Amenhotep from Four. I mean Kuenaten. He changed his name, you know, because half of it was that of the father of the gods. She is interested in the question of plural marriage. Goodbye. I wish to have a word with my grandfather, Ramesses I. He was fond of me as a little boy. At this moment, Smith's interest in that queer conversation died away, for of a sudden he beheld none other than the queen of his dreams, Marmy. Oh, there she stood, without a doubt, only ten times more beautiful than he had ever pictured her. She was tall and somewhat fair-complexioned, with slumbrous dark eyes, and on her face gleamed the mystic smile he loved. She wore a robe of simple white and a purple-broidered apron. A crown of golden urai with turquoise eyes was set upon her dark hair as in her statue, and on her breast and arms were the very necklace and bracelets that he had taken from her tomb. She appeared to be somewhat moody, or rather thoughtful, for she leaned by herself against a balustrade, watching the throng without much interest. Presently, a pharaoh, a black-browed, vigorous man with thick lips, drew near. I greet your majesty, he said. She started and answered, Oh, it is you. I make my obeisance to your majesty. And she curtsied to him, humbly enough, but with a suggestion of mockery in her movements. Well, you do not seem to have been very anxious to find me, Marmy, which, considering that we meet so seldom, I saw that your majesty was engaged with my sister queens, she interrupted in a rich, low voice, and with some other ladies in the gallery there, whose faces I seem to remember, but who I think were not queens, unless indeed you married them after I was drawn away. One must talk to one's relations, replied the pharaoh. Quite so. But you see, I have no relations, at least none whom I know well. My parents, you will remember, died when I was young, leaving me Egypt's heiress, and they are still vexed at the marriage which I made on the advice of my counsellors. But is it not annoying? I have lost one of my rings, that which had the god bees on it. Some dweller on the earth must be wearing it today, and that is why I cannot get it back from him. Him? Why him? Hush, the business is about to begin. What business, my lord? Oh, the question of the violation of our tombs, I believe. Indeed, that is a large subject, and not a very profitable one, I should say. Tell me, who is that? And she pointed to a lady who had stepped forward, a very splendid person, magnificently arrayed. Cleopatra the Greek, he answered, the last of Egypt's sovereigns, one of the Ptolemies. You can always know her by that Roman who walks about after her. Which? asked Marmy. I see several, also other men. She was the wretch who rolled Egypt in the dirt and betrayed her. Oh, if it were not for the law of peace by which we must abide when we meet thus. You mean that she would be torn to shreds, Marmy, and her very soul scattered like the limbs of Osiris. Well, if it were not for that law of peace, so perhaps would many of us, for never have I heard a single king among these hundreds speak altogether well of those who went before or followed after him especially of those who went before, if they happened to have hammered out their cartouches and usurped their monuments, said the queen dryly, and looking him in the eyes. At this home thrust, the pharaoh seemed to wince. Making no answer, he pointed to the royal woman who had mounted the steps at the end of the hall. Queen Cleopatra lifted her hand and stood thus for a while. Very splendid she was, and Smith, on his hands and knees behind the boarding of the boat, thanked his stars that alone among modern men it had been his lot to look upon her rich and living loveliness. There she shone, she who had changed the fortunes of the world, 
She who, whatever she did amiss, at least had known how to die. Silence fell upon that glittering galaxy of kings and queens, and upon all the hundreds of their offspring, their women and their great officers, who crowded the double tier of galleries around the hall. Royalties of Egypt, she began, in a sweet, clear voice which penetrated to the farthest recesses of the place. I, Cleopatra, the sixth of that name, and the last monarch who ruled over the upper and the lower lands before Egypt became a home of slaves, have a word to say to your majesties, who, in your mortal days, all of you more worthily filled the throne on which once I sat. I do not speak of Egypt and its fate, or of our sins, whereof mine were not the least, that brought her to the dust. Those sins I and others expiate elsewhere, and of them from age to age we hear enough. But on this one night of the year, that of the feast of him whom we call Osiris, but whom other nations have known and know by different names, it is given to us once more to be mortal for an hour, and though we be but shadows, to renew the loves and hates of our long-perished flesh. Here for an hour we strut in our forgotten pomp, the crowns that were ours still adorn our brows, and once more we seem to listen to our people's praise. Our hopes are the hopes of mortal life, our foes are the foes we feared, our gods grow real again, and our lovers whisper in our ears. Moreover, this joy is given to us, to see each other as we are, to know as the gods know, and therefore to forgive, even where we despise and hate. Now I have done, and I, the youngest of the rulers of ancient Egypt, call upon him who was the first of her kings to take my place. She bowed, and the audience bowed back to her. Then she descended the steps and was lost in the throng. Where she had been appeared an old man, simply clad, long-bearded, wise-faced, and wearing on his grey hair no crown save a plain band of gold, from the centre of which rose the snake-headed Uraeus crest. Your majesties who came after me, said the old man, I am Menes, the first of the accepted pharaohs of Egypt, although many of those who went before me were more truly kings than I. Yet, as the first who joined the upper and the lower lands, and took the royal style and titles, and ruled as well as I could rule, it is given to me to talk with you for a while this night, whereon our spirits are permitted to gather from the uttermost parts of the uttermost worlds and see each other face to face. First, in darkness and in secret, let us speak of the mystery of the gods and of its meanings. Next, in darkness and in secret, let us speak of the mystery of our lives, of whence they come, of where they tarry by the road, and whither they go at last. And afterwards, let us speak of other matters face to face in light and openness, as we were wont to do when we were men. Then hence to Thebes, there to celebrate our yearly festival. Is such your will? Such is our will, they answered. It seemed to Smith that dense darkness fell upon the place, and with it, a silence that was awful. For a time that he could not reckon that might have been years or might have been moments, he sat there in the utter darkness and the utter silence. At length the light came again, first as a blue spark, then in upward pouring rays, and lastly pervading all. There stood menace on the steps, and there in front of him was gathered the same royal throng. The mysteries are finished, said the old king. Now, if any have aught to say, let it be said openly. A young man, dressed in the robes and ornaments of an early dynasty, came forward and stood upon the steps between the pharaoh Menes and all those who had reigned after him. His face seemed familiar to Smith, as was the side-lock that hung down behind his right ear in token of his youth. Where had he seen him? Ah, he remembered. Only a few hours ago, lying in one of the cases of the museum, together with the bones of the pharaoh Unas. Your majesties, he began, I am the king Metasuphis. The matter that I wish to lay before you is that of the violation of our sepulchres by those men who now live upon the earth. 
The mortal bodies of many who are gathered here tonight lie in this place to be stared at and mocked by the curious. I myself am one of them, jawless, broken, hideous to behold. Yonder, day by day, must my car sit watching my desecrated flesh, torn from the pyramid that, with cost and labor, I raised up to be an eternal house wherein I might hide till the hour of resurrection. Others of us lie in far lands. Thus, as he can tell you, my predecessor, Man Khao Ra, he who built the third of the great pyramids, the Pyramid of Her, sleeps, or rather wakes in a dark city called London, across the seas, a place of murk where no sun shines. Others have been burnt with fire, others are scattered in small dust. The ornaments that were ours are stole away and sold to the greedy. Our sacred writings and our symbols are their jest. Soon there will not be one holy grave in Egypt that remains undefiled. That is so, said a voice from the company. But four months gone, the deep, deep pit was opened that I had dug in the shadow of the pyramid of Sephron, who begat me in the world. There in my chamber I slept alone, two handfuls of white bones, since when I died they did not preserve the body with wrappings and with spices. Now I see those bones of mine, beside which my double has watched for these five thousand years, hid in the blackness of a great ship, and tossing on a sea that is strewn with ice. It is so, echoed a hundred other voices. Then, went on the young king, turning to Menes, I ask of your majesty whether there is no means whereby we may be avenged on those who do us this foul wrong. Let him who has wisdom speak, said the old pharaoh. A man of middle age, short in stature and of a thoughtful brow, who held in his hand a wand and wore the feathers and insignia of the heir to the throne of Egypt and of a high priest of our men, moved to the steps. Smith knew him at once from his statues. He was Kaimuat, son of Ramesses the Great, the mightiest magician that ever was in Egypt, who of his own will withdrew himself from earth before the time came that he should sit upon the throne. I have wisdom, your majesties, and I will answer, he said. The time draws on when, in the land of death which is life, the land that we call Amenti, it will be given to us to lay our wrongs as to this matter before those who judge, knowing that they will be avenged. On this night of the year also, when we resume the shapes we were, we have certain powers of vengeance, or rather of executing justice. But our time is short, and there is much to say and do before the sun god Ra arises, and we depart each to his place. Therefore, it seems best that we should leave these wicked ones in their wickedness, till we meet them face to face beyond the world. Smith, who had been following the words of Camus with the closest attention and considerable anxiety, breathed again, thanking heaven that the engagements of these departed monarchs were so numerous and pressing. Still, as a matter of precaution, he drew the cigar box which contained Marmy's hand from his pocket and pushed it as far away from him as he could. It was a most unlucky act. Perhaps the cigar box grated on the floor, or perhaps the fact of his touching the relic put him into psychic communication with all these spirits. At any rate, he became aware that the eyes of that dreadful magician were fixed upon him, and that a bone had a better chance of escaping the search of a Röntgen ray than he of hiding himself from their baleful glare. As it happens, however, went on Camus in a cold voice, I now perceive that there is hidden in this place, and spying on us, one of the worst of these vile thieves. I say to your majesties that I see him crouched beneath yonder funeral barge, and that he has with him at this moment the hand of one of your majesties, stolen by him from her tomb at Thebes. Now every queen in the company became visibly agitated. Smith, who was watching Marmy, saw her hold up her hands and look at them, while all the pharaohs pointed with their fingers and exclaimed together, in a voice that rolled round the hall like thunder, Let him be brought forth to judgment. Camus raised his wand, and holding it towards the boat where Smith was hidden, said, Draw near, vile one, bringing with thee that thou hast stolen. 
Smith tried hard to remain where he was. He sat himself down and set his heels against the floor. As the reader knows, he was always shy and retiring by disposition, and never had these weaknesses oppressed him more than they did just then. When a child, his favourite nightmare had been that the foreman of a jury was in the act of proclaiming him guilty of some dreadful but unstated crime. Now he understood what that nightmare foreshadowed. He was about to be convicted in a court of which all the kings and queens of Egypt were the jury. Menes was chief justice, and the magician Camus played the role of attorney general. In vain did he sit down and hold fast. Some power took possession of him, which forced him first to stretch out his arm and pick up the cigar box containing the hand of Marmi, and next drew him from the friendly shelter of the deal boards that were about the boat. Now he was on his feet and walking down the flight of steps opposite to those on which Menes stood far away. Now he was among all that throng of ghosts which parted to let him pass, looking at him as he went with cold and wondering eyes. They were very majestic ghosts. The ages that had gone by since they laid down their scepters had taken nothing from their royal dignity. Moreover, save one, none of them seemed to have any pity for his plight. She was a little princess who stood by her mother, that same little princess whose mummy he had seen and pitied in the director's room with a lotus flower thrust beneath her bandages. As he passed, Smith heard her say, This vile one is frightened. Be brave, vile one. Smith understood, and pride came to his aid. He, a gentleman of the modern world, would not show the white feather before a crowd of ancient Egyptian ghosts. Turning to the child, he smiled at her, then drew himself to his full height and walked on quietly. Here it may be stated that Smith was a tall man, still comparatively young and very good-looking, straight and spare in frame, with dark, pleasant eyes and a little black beard. At least he is a well-favoured thief, said one of the queens to another. Yes, answered she who had been addressed. I wonder that a man with such a noble air should find pleasure in disturbing graves and stealing the offerings of the dead, words that gave Smith much cause for thought. He had never considered the matter in this light. Now he came to the place where Marmi stood, the black-browed pharaoh who had been her husband at her side. On his left hand, which held the cigar box, was the gold bees ring, and that box he felt constrained to carry pressed against him just over his heart. As he went by, he turned his head, and his eyes met those of Marmi. She started violently. Then she saw the ring upon his hand, and again started still more violently. What ails your majesty? asked the pharaoh. Oh, naught, she answered. Yet does this earth-dweller remind you of anyone? Yes, he does, answered the pharaoh. He reminds me very much of that accursed sculptor about whom we had words. Do you mean a certain Horu, the court artist? He who worked the image that was buried with me, and whom you sent to carve your statues in the deserts of Kush until he died of fevers, or was it poison? Aye. Horu and no other may set take and keep him, growled the pharaoh. Then Smith passed on and heard no more. Now he stood before the venerable Menes. Some instinct caused him to bow to this pharaoh, who bowed back to him. Then he turned and bowed to the royal company, and they also bowed back to him, coldly, but very gravely and courteously. Dweller on the world where once we had our place, and therefore brother of us, the dead, began Menes, this divine priest and magician, and he pointed to Camus, declares that you are one of those who foully violate our sepulchres and desecrate our ashes. He declares, moreover, that at this very moment you have with you a portion of the mortal flesh of a certain majesty whose spirit is present here. Say now, are these things true? To his astonishment, Smith found that he had not the slightest difficulty in answering in the same sweet tongue. O king, they are true and not true. Hear me, rulers of Egypt. It is true that I have searched in your graves, because my heart has been drawn towards you, and I would learn all that I could concerning you, for it comes to me now that once I was one of you, 
No king indeed, yet perchance of the blood of kings. Also, for I would hide nothing even if I could, I searched for one tomb above all others. Why, O oh man? asked the judge. Because a face drew me, a lovely face that was cut in stone. Now all that great audience turned their eyes towards him and listened as though his words moved them. Did you find that holy tomb? asked Menes. If so, what did you find therein? Ay, Pharaoh, and in it I found these. And he took from the box the withered hand, from his pocket the broken bronze, and from his finger the ring. Also I found other things which I delivered to the keeper of this place, articles of jewellery that I seem to see tonight upon one who is present here among you. Is the face of this figure the face you sought? asked the judge. It is the lovely face, he answered. Menes took the effigy in his hand and read the cartouche that was engraved beneath its breast. If there be here among us, he said presently, one who long after my day ruled as queen in Egypt, one who was named Mame, let her draw near. Now from where she stood glided Mami and took her place opposite to Smith. Say, O oh queen, asked Menes, do you know aught of this matter? I know that hand, it was my own hand, she answered. I know that ring, it was my ring. I know that image in bronze, it was my image. Look on me and judge for yourselves whether this be so. A certain sculptor fashioned it, the son of a king's son, who was named Horu the first of sculptors and the head artist of my court. There, clad in strange garments, he stands before you. Horu, or the double of Horu, he who cut the image when I ruled in Egypt, is he who found the image and the man who stands before you, or mayhap his double cast in the same mould. The pharaoh Menes turned to the magician Kaimuas and said, Are these things so, O seer? They are so, answered Kaimuas. This dweller on the earth is he who, long ago, was the sculptor Horu. But what shall that avail? He once more a living man is a violator of the hallowed dead. I say, therefore, that judgment should be executed on his flesh, so that when the light comes here tomorrow, he himself will again be gathered to the dead. Menes bent his head upon his breast and pondered. Smith said nothing. To him the whole play was so curious that he had no wish to interfere with its development. If these ghosts wished to make him of their number, let them do so. He had no ties on earth, and now when he knew full surely that there was a life beyond this of earth, he was quite prepared to explore its mysteries. So he folded his arms upon his breast and awaited the sentence. But Marmi did not wait. She raised her hand so swiftly that the bracelets jingled on her wrists and spoke out with boldness. Royal Camus, prince and magician, she said, hearken to one who, like you, was Egypt's heir centuries before you were born, one also who ruled over the two lands and not so ill, which prince never was your lot. Answer me, is all wisdom centered in your breast? Answer me, do you alone know the mysteries of life and death? Answer me. Did your god Amen teach you that vengeance went before mercy? Answer me. Did he teach you that men should be judged unheard, that they should be hurried by violence to Osiris ere their time, and thereby separated from the dead ones whom they loved and forced to return to live again upon this evil earth? Listen. When the last moon was near her full, my spirit sat in my tomb in the burying place of queens. My spirit saw this man enter into my tomb and what he did there. With bowed head, he looked upon my bones that a thief of the priesthood had robbed and burnt within twenty years of their burial, in which he himself had taken part. And what did this man with those bones, he who was once Horu? I tell you that he hid them away there in the tomb where he thought they could not be found again. Who then was the thief and the violator? He who robbed and burnt my bones, or he who buried them with reverence. Again, he found the jewels that the priest of your brotherhood had dropped in his flight when the smoke of the burning flesh and spices overpowered him, and with them the hand, 
which that wicked one had broken off from the body of my majesty. What did this man then? He took the jewels. Would you have had him leave them to be stolen by some peasant? And the hand? I tell you that he kissed that poor dead hand, which once had been part of the body of my majesty, and that now he treasures it as a holy relic. My spirit saw him do these things, and made report thereof to me. I ask you, therefore, prince, I ask you all, royalties of Egypt, whether for such deeds this man should die. Now Camus, the advocate of vengeance, shrugged his shoulders and smiled meaningly, but the congregation of kings and queens thundered an answer, and it was, No! Mami looked to menace to give judgment. Before he could speak, the dark-browed pharaoh who had named her wife strode forward and addressed them. Her Majesty, heiress of Egypt, royal wife, lady of the two lands has spoken, he cried. Now let me speak who was the husband of Her Majesty. Whether this man was once Horu the sculptor I know not. If so, he was also an evildoer who by my decree died in banishment in the land of Cush. Whatever be the truth as to that matter, he admits that he violated the tomb of Her Majesty and stole what the old thieves had left. Her Majesty says also, and he does not deny it, that he dared to kiss her hand, and for a man to kiss the hand of a wedded queen of Egypt, the punishment is death. I claim that this man should die to the world before his time, that in a day to come again he may live and suffer in the world. Judge, O Menes. Menes lifted his head and spoke, saying, Repeat to me the law, O Pharaoh, under which a living man must die for the kissing of a dead hand. In my day, and in that of those who went before me, there was no such law in Egypt. If a living man, who was not her husband or of her kin, kissed the living hand of a wedded queen of Egypt, save in ceremony, then perchance he might be called upon to die. Perchance for such a reason a certain Horu once was called upon to die. But in the grave there is no marriage, and therefore even if he had found her alive within the tomb and kissed her hand, or even her lips, why should he die for the crime of love? Hear me all, this is my judgment in the matter. Let the soul of that priest who first violated the tomb of the royal Marmee be hunted down and given to the jaws of the destroyer, that he may know the last depths of death, if so the gods declare. But let this man go from among us unharmed, since what he did he did in reverent ignorance, and because Hathor, goddess of love, guided him from of old. Love rules this world wherein we meet tonight, with all the worlds whence we have gathered or whither we still must go. Who can defy its power? Who can refuse its rights? Now hence to Thebes. There was a rushing sound as of a thousand wings, and all were gone. No, not all, since Smith yet stood before the draped colossi and the empty steps, and beside him, glorious, unearthly, gleamed the vision of Marmi. I too must away, she whispered, yet ere I go a word with you who once were a sculptor in Egypt. You loved me then, and that love cost you your life. You who once dared to kiss this hand of mine that again you kissed in yonder tomb. For I was Pharaoh's wife in name only. Understand me well, in name only. Since that title of royal mother which they gave me is but a graven lie. Horu, I never was a wife, and when you died, swiftly I followed you to the grave. Oh, you forget. But I remember. I remember many things. You think that the priestly thief broke this figure of me which you found in the sand outside my tomb. Not so. I broke it, because daring greatly you had written thereon, Beloved, not of Horus the god, as you should have done, but of Horu the man. So when I came to be buried, Pharaoh, knowing all, took the image from my wrappings and hurled it away. I remember, too, the casting of that image, and how you threw a gold chain I had given you into the crucible with the bronze, saying that gold alone was fit to fashion me. And this signet that I bear, it was you who cut it. Take it, take it, Horu, and in its place give me back that which is on your hand, the B.E.'s ring that I also wore. Take it, 
and wear it ever till you die again, and let it go to the grave with you as once it went to the grave with me. Now hearken. When Ra, the great sun, arises again, and you awake, you will think that you have dreamed a dream. You will think that in this dream you saw and spoke with a lady of Egypt who died more than three thousand years ago, but whose beauty, carved in stone and bronze, has charmed your heart today. So let it be, yet know, O man, who once was named Horu, that such dreams are oft times a shadow of the truth. Know that this glory which shines before you is mine indeed in the land that is both far and near, the land wherein I dwell eternally, and that what is mine has been, is, and shall be yours forever. Gods may change their kingdoms and their names. Men may live and die, and live again once more to die. Empires may fall, and those who ruled them be turned to forgotten dust. Yet true love endures immortal as the souls in which it was conceived, and from it, for you and me, the night of woe and separation done, at the daybreak which draws on, there shall be born the splendour and the peace of union. Till that hour foredoomed, seek me no more, though I be ever near you as I have ever been. Till that most blessed hour, Horu, farewell. She bent towards him, her sweet lips touched his brow, the perfume from her breath and hair beat upon him, the light of her wondrous eyes searched out his very soul, reading the answer that was written there. He stretched out his arms to clasp her, and lo, she was gone. It was a very cold and a very stiff smith who awoke on the following morning to find himself exactly where he had lain down, namely, on a cement floor beneath the keel of a funeral boat in the central hall of the Cairo Museum. He crept from his shelter shivering and looked at this hall to find it quite as empty as it had been on the previous evening. Not a sign or a token was there of Pharaoh Menes and all those kings and queens of whom he had dreamed so vividly. Reflecting on the strange fantasies that weariness and excited nerves can summon to the mind in sleep, Smith made his way to the great doors and waited in the shadow, praying earnestly that, although it was the Mohammedan Sabbath, someone might visit the museum to see that all was well. As a matter of fact, someone did, and before he had been there a minute, a watchman going about his business. He unlocked the place carelessly, looking over his shoulder at a kite fighting with two nesting crows. In an instant, Smith, who was not minded to stop and answer questions, had slipped past him and was gliding down the portico, from monument to monument, like a snake between boulders, still keeping in the shadow as he headed for the gates. The attendant caught sight of him and uttered a yell of fear. Then, since it is not good to look upon an afreet appearing from whence no mortal man could be, he turned his head away. When he looked again, Smith was through those gates and had mingled with the crowd in the street beyond. The sunshine was very pleasant to one who was conscious of having contracted a chill of the worst Egyptian order from long contact with a damp stone floor. Smith walked on through it towards his hotel. It was Shepherd's, and more than a mile away, making up a story as he went to tell the hall porter of how he had gone to dine at Mina House by the pyramids, missed the last tram, and stopped the night there. Whilst he was thus engaged, his left hand struck somewhat sharply against the corner of the cigar box in his pocket, that which contained the relic of the Queen Marmy. The pain caused him to glance at his fingers to see if they were injured, and to perceive on one of them the ring he wore. Surely, surely it was not the same that the Director General had given him. That ring was engraved with the image of the god Bees. On this, was cut the cartouche of Her Majesty Marmy, and he had dreamed, oh, he had dreamed. To this day, Smith is wondering whether, in the hurry of the moment, he made a mistake as to which of those rings the Director General had given him as part of his share of the spoil of the royal tomb he discovered in the Valley of Queens. Afterwards, Smith wrote to ask, but the Director General could only remember that he gave him one of the two rings and assured him that that inscribed Bees Ank Ank Bees was with Marmy's other jewels in the gold room of the museum. 
Also, Smith is wondering whether any other bronze figure of an old Egyptian royalty shows so high a percentage of gold as, on analysis, the broken image of Mami was proved to do. For had she not seemed to tell him a tale of the melting of a golden chain when that effigy was cast, was it all only a dream, or was it something more? By day and by night he asks of nothingness. But be she near or far, no answer comes from the Queen Mami, whose proud titles were Her Majesty the Good God, the Justified Dweller in Osiris, Daughter of Amen, Royal Heiress, Royal Sister, Royal Wife, Royal Mother, Lady of the Two Lands, Wearer of the Double Crown, of the White Crown, of the Red Crown, Sweet Flower of Love, Beautiful Eternally. So, like the rest of us, Smith must wait to learn the truth concerning many things, and more particularly as to which of those two circles of ancient gold the Director General gave him yonder at Cairo. It seems but a little matter, yet it is more than all the worlds to him. To the astonishment of his colleagues in antiquarian research, Smith has never returned to Egypt. He explains to them that his health is quite restored and that he no longer needs this annual change to a more temperate clime. Now, which of the two royal rings did the Director General return to Smith on the mummied hand of her late Majesty Mami? The Ring of Thoth, a short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Mr. John Van Sittart Smith, FRS, of 147A Gower Street, was a man whose energy of purpose and clearness of thought might have placed him in the very first rank of scientific observers. He was the victim, however, of a universal ambition which prompted him to aim at distinction in many subjects rather than preeminence in one. In his early days, he had shown an aptitude for zoology and for botany, which caused his friends to look upon him as a second Darwin. But when a professorship was almost within his reach, he had suddenly discontinued his studies and turned his whole attention to chemistry. Here, his researches upon the spectra of the metals had won him his fellowship in the Royal Society, but again he played the coquette with his subject, and after a year's absence from the laboratory, he joined the Oriental Society and delivered a paper on the hieroglyphic and demotic inscriptions of El Kab, thus giving a crowning example both of the versatility and of the inconstancy of his talents. The most fickle of wooers, however, is apt to be caught at last, and so it was with John Van Sittart Smith. The more he burrowed his way into Egyptology, the more impressed he became by the vast field which it opened to the inquirer, and by the extreme importance of a subject which promised to throw a light upon the first germs of human civilization and the origin of the greater part of our arts and sciences. So struck was Mr. Smith that he straightway married an Egyptological young lady who had written upon the Sixth Dynasty, and having thus secured a sound base of operations, he set himself to collect materials for a work which should unite the research of Lepsius and the ingenuity of Champollion. The preparation of this magnum opus entailed many hurried visits to the magnificent Egyptian collections of the Louvre, upon the last of which, no longer ago than the middle of last October, he became involved in a most strange and noteworthy adventure. The trains had been slow and the channel had been rough, so that the student arrived in Paris in a somewhat befogged and feverish condition. On reaching the Hôtel de France, in the Rue Lafitte, he had thrown himself upon a sofa for a couple of hours, but finding that he was unable to sleep, he determined, in spite of his fatigue, to make his way to the Louvre, settle the point which he had come to decide, and take the evening train back to Dieppe. Having come to this conclusion, he donned his greatcoat, for it was a raw, rainy day, and made his way across the Boulevard des Italiens and down the Avenue de l'Opera. Once in the Louvre, he was on familiar ground, and he speedily made his way to the collection of papyri which it was his intention to consult. 
the warmest admirers of John Vansittart Smith could hardly claim for him that he was a handsome man. His high-beaked nose and prominent chin had something of the same acute and incisive character which distinguished his intellect. He held his head in a bird-like fashion, and bird-like, too, was the pecking motion with which, in conversation, he threw out his objections and retorts. As he stood, with the high collar of his greatcoat raised to his ears, he might have seen from the reflection in the glass case before him that his appearance was a singular one. Yet it came upon him as a sudden jar when an English voice behind him exclaimed in very audible tones, What a queer-looking mortal! The student had a large amount of petty vanity in his composition, which manifested itself by an ostentatious and overdone disregard of all personal considerations. He straightened his lips and looked rigidly at the roll of papyrus, while his heart filled with bitterness against the whole race of travelling Britons. Yes, said another voice, he really is an extraordinary fellow. Do you know, said the first speaker, one could almost believe that by the continual contemplation of mummies the chap has become half a mummy himself. He has certainly an Egyptian cast of countenance, said the other. John Vansittart Smith spun round upon his heel with the intention of shaming his countrymen by a corrosive remark or two. To his surprise and relief, the two young fellows who had been conversing had their shoulders turned towards him and were gazing at one of the Louvre attendants who was polishing some brass work at the other side of the room. Carter will be waiting for us at the Palais Royal, said one tourist to the other, glancing at his watch, and they clattered away, leaving the student to his labours. I wonder what these chatterers call an Egyptian cast of countenance, thought John Vansittart Smith, and he moved his position slightly in order to catch a glimpse of the man's face. He started as his eyes fell upon it. It was indeed the very face with which his studies had made him familiar. The regular statuesque features, broad brow, well-rounded chin, and dusky complexion were the exact counterpart of the innumerable statues, mummy cases, and pictures which adorned the walls of the apartment. The thing was beyond all coincidence. The man must be an Egyptian. The national angularity of the shoulders and narrowness of the hips were alone sufficient to identify him. John Vansittart Smith shuffled towards the attendant with some intention of addressing him. He was not light of touch in conversation, and found it difficult to strike the happy mean between the brusqueness of the superior and the geniality of the equal. As he came nearer, the man presented his side face to him, but kept his gaze still bent upon his work. Vansittart Smith, fixing his eyes upon the fellow's skin, was conscious of a sudden impression that there was something inhuman and preternatural about its appearance. Over the temple and cheekbone, it was as glazed and as shiny as varnished parchment. There was no suggestion of pause. One could not fancy a drop of moisture upon that arid surface. From brow to chin, however, it was cross-hatched by a million delicate wrinkles which shot and interlaced as though nature in some Maori mood had tried how wild and intricate a pattern she could devise. Où est la collection de Memphis? asked the student, with the awkward air of a man who is devising a question merely for the purpose of opening a conversation. C'est là, replied the man brusquely, nodding his head at the other side of the room. Vous êtes un Egyptien, n'est-ce pas? asked the Englishman. The attendant looked up and turned his strange dark eyes upon his questioner. They were vitreous, with a misty dry shininess, such as Smith had never seen in a human head before. As he gazed into them, he saw some strong emotion gather in their depths, which rose and deepened until it broke into a look of something akin both to horror and to hatred. Non, monsieur, je suis français. The man turned abruptly and bent low over his polishing. The student gazed at him for a moment in astonishment, and then turning to a chair in a retired corner behind one of the doors, he proceeded to make notes of his researches among the papyri. His thoughts, however, refused to return into their natural groove. They would run upon the enigmatical attendant with the sphinx-like face and the parchment skin. Where have I seen such eyes? said Vansittart Smith to himself. 
There is something saurian about them, something reptilian. There's the membrana nictitans of the snakes, he mused, bethinking himself of his zoological studies. It gives a shiny effect. But there was something more here. There was a sense of power, of wisdom, so I read them, and of weariness, utter weariness, and ineffable despair. It may be all imagination, but I never had so strong an impression. By Jove, I must have another look at them. He rose and paced round the Egyptian rooms, but the man who had excited his curiosity had disappeared. The student sat down again in his quiet corner and continued to work at his notes. He had gained the information which he required from the papyri, and it only remained to write it down while it was still fresh in his memory. For a time his pencil travelled rapidly over the paper, but soon the lines became less level, the words more blurred, and finally the pencil tinkled down upon the floor, and the head of the student dropped heavily forward upon his chest. Tired out by his journey, he slept so soundly in his lonely post behind the door that neither the clanking civil guard, nor the footsteps of sightseers, nor even the loud hoarse bell which gives the signal for closing were sufficient to arouse him. Twilight deepened into darkness, the bustle from the Rue de Rivoli waxed and then waned, distant Notre Dame clanged out the hour of midnight, and still the dark and lonely figure sat silently in the shadow. It was not until close upon one in the morning that with a sudden gasp and an intaking of the breath, Van Sittart Smith returned to consciousness. For a moment it flashed upon him that he had dropped asleep in his study chair at home. The moon was shining fitfully through the unshuttered window, however, and as his eye ran along the lines of mummies and the endless array of polished cases, he remembered clearly where he was and how he came there. The student was not a nervous man. He possessed that love of a novel situation which is peculiar to his race. Stretching out his cramped limbs, he looked at his watch and burst into a chuckle as he observed the hour. The episode would make an admirable anecdote to be introduced into his next paper as a relief to the graver and heavier speculations. He was a little cold, but wide awake and much refreshed. It was no wonder that the guardians had overlooked him, for the door threw its heavy black shadow right across him. The complete silence was impressive. Neither outside nor inside was there a creak or a murmur. He was alone with the dead men of a dead civilization. What though the outer city reeked of the garish nineteenth century? In all this chamber there was scarce an article, from the shriveled ear of wheat to the pigment box of the painter, which had not held its own against four thousand years. Here was the flotsam and jetsam washed up by the great ocean of time from that far-off empire, from stately Thebes, from lordly Luxor, from the great temples of Heliopolis, from a hundred rifled tombs, these relics had been brought. The student glanced round at the long, silent figures who flickered vaguely up through the gloom, at the busy toilers who were now so restful, and he fell into a reverent and thoughtful mood. An unwonted sense of his own youth and insignificance came over him. Leaning back in his chair, he gazed dreamily down the long vista of rooms, all silvery with the moonshine, which extend through the whole wing of the widespread building. His eyes fell upon the yellow glare of a distant lamp. John Van Sittart Smith sat up on his chair with his nerves all on edge. The light was advancing slowly towards him, pausing from time to time, and then coming jerkily onwards. The bearer moved noiselessly. In the utter silence there was no suspicion of the pat of a footfall. An idea of robbers entered the Englishman's head. He snuggled up further into the corner. The light was two rooms off. Now it was in the next chamber, and still there was no sound. With something approaching to a thrill of fear, the student observed a face, floating in the air as it were, behind the flare of the lamp. The figure was wrapped in shadow, but the light fell full upon the strange, eager face. There was no mistaking the metallic glistening eyes and the cadaverous skin. It was the attendant with whom he had conversed. Van Sittart Smith's first impulse was to come forward and address him, 
a few words of explanation would set the matter clear and lead doubtless to his being conducted to some side door from which he might make his way to his hotel. As the man entered the chamber, however, there was something so stealthy in his movements and so furtive in his expression that the Englishman altered his intention. This was clearly no ordinary official walking the rounds. The fellow wore felt-soled slippers, stepped with a rising chest, and glanced quickly from left to right, while his hurried, gasping breathing thrilled the flame of his lamp. Van Sittart Smith crouched silently back into the corner and watched him keenly, convinced that his errand was one of secret and probably sinister import. There was no hesitation in the other's movements. He stepped lightly and swiftly across to one of the great cases, and drawing a key from his pocket, he unlocked it. From the upper shelf, he pulled down a mummy which he bore away with him and laid it with much care and solicitude upon the ground. By it, he placed his lamp, and then squatting down beside it in eastern fashion, he began with long, quivering fingers to undo the cercloths and bandages which girt it round. As the crackling rolls of linen peeled off one after the other, a strong aromatic odour filled the chamber, and fragments of scented wood and of spices pattered down upon the marble floor. It was clear to John Vansittart Smith that this mummy had never been unswathed before. The operation interested him keenly. He thrilled all over with curiosity, and his bird-like head protruded further and further from behind the door. When, however, the last roll had been removed from the four-thousand-year-old head, it was all that he could do to stifle an outcry of amazement. First, a cascade of long, black, glossy tresses poured over the workman's hands and arms. A second turn of the bandage revealed a low, white forehead with a pair of delicately arched eyebrows. A third uncovered a pair of bright, deeply fringed eyes and a straight, well-cut nose, while a fourth and last showed a sweet, full, sensitive mouth and a beautifully curved chin. The whole face was one of extraordinary loveliness, save for the one blemish that in the centre of the forehead there was a single, irregular, coffee-coloured splotch. It was a triumph of the embalmer's art. Vansittart Smith's eyes grew larger and larger as he gazed upon it, and he chirruped in his throat with satisfaction. Its effect upon the Egyptologist was as nothing, however, compared with that which it produced upon the strange attendant. He threw his hands up into the air, burst into a harsh clatter of words, and then, hurling himself down upon the ground beside the mummy, he threw his arms round her and kissed her repeatedly upon the lips and brow. Ma petite, he groaned in French, ma pauvre petite. His voice broke with emotion, and his innumerable wrinkles quivered and writhed, but the student observed in the lamplight that his shining eyes were still as dry and tearless as two beads of steel. For some minutes he lay, with a twitching face, crooning and moaning over the beautiful head. Then he broke into a sudden smile, said some words in an unknown tongue, and sprang to his feet with the vigorous air of one who has braced himself for an effort. In the centre of the room, there was a large circular case which contained, as the student had frequently remarked, a magnificent collection of early Egyptian rings and precious stones. To this, the attendant strode, and unlocking it, he threw it open. On the ledge at the side, he placed his lamp, and beside it, a small earthenware jar, which he had drawn from his pocket. He then took a handful of rings from the case, and with a most serious and anxious face, he proceeded to smear each in turn with some liquid substance from the earthen pot, holding them to the light as he did so. He was clearly disappointed with the first lot, for he threw them petulantly back into the case and drew out some more. One of these, a massive ring with a large crystal set in it, he seized and eagerly tested with the contents of the jar. Instantly, he uttered a cry of joy and threw out his arms in a wild gesture which upset the pot and sent the liquid streaming across the floor to the very feet of the Englishman. The attendant drew a red handkerchief from his bosom, and mopping up the mess, he followed it into the corner, where in a moment he found himself face to face with his observer. "'Excuse me,' said John Vansittart Smith, with all imaginable politeness. 
I have been unfortunate enough to fall asleep behind this door. And you have been watching me? The other asked in English, with a most venomous look on his corpse-like face. The student was a man of veracity. I confess, said he, that I have noticed your movements, and that they have aroused my curiosity and interest in the highest degree. The man drew a long, flamboyant-bladed knife from his bosom. You have had a very narrow escape, he said. Had I seen you ten minutes ago, I should have driven this through your heart. As it is, if you touch me or interfere with me in any way, you are a dead man. I have no wish to interfere with you, the student answered. My presence here is entirely accidental. All I ask is that you will have the extreme kindness to show me out through some side door. He spoke with great suavity, for the man was still pressing the tip of his dagger against the palm of his left hand, as though to assure himself of its sharpness, while his face preserved its malignant expression. If I thought, said he, but no, perhaps it is as well. What is your name? The Englishman gave it. Van Sittart Smith, the other repeated. Are you the same Van Sittart Smith who gave a paper in London upon El Cab? I saw a report of it. Your knowledge of the subject is contemptible. Sir, cried the Egyptologist, yet it is superior to that of many who make even greater pretensions. The whole keystone of our old life in Egypt was not the inscriptions or monuments of which you make so much, but was our hermetic philosophy and mystic knowledge, of which you say little or nothing. Our old life, repeated the scholar, wide-eyed, and then suddenly, good God, look at the mummy's face. The strange man turned and flashed his light upon the dead woman, uttering a long, doleful cry as he did so. The action of the air had already undone all the art of the embalmer. The skin had fallen away, the eyes had sunk inwards, the discoloured lips had writhed away from the yellow teeth, and the brown mark upon the forehead alone showed that it was indeed the same face which had shown such youth and beauty a few short minutes before. The man flapped his hands together in grief and horror. Then mastering himself by a strong effort, he turned his hard eyes once more upon the Englishman. It does not matter, he said in a shaking voice. It does not really matter. I came here tonight with the fixed determination to do something. It is now done. All else is as nothing. I have found my quest. The old curse is broken. I can rejoin her. What matter about her inanimate shell so long as her spirit is awaiting me at the other side of the veil? These are wild words, said Vansittart Smith. He was becoming more and more convinced that he had to do with a madman. Time presses and I must go, continued the other. The moment is at hand for which I have waited this weary time. But I must show you out first. Come with me. Taking up the lamp, he turned from the disordered chamber and led the student swiftly through the long series of the Egyptian, Assyrian, and Persian apartments. At the end of the latter, he pushed open a small door let into the wall and descended a winding stone stair. The Englishman felt the cold, fresh air of the night upon his brow. There was a door opposite him which appeared to communicate with the street. To the right of this, another door stood ajar, throwing a spurt of yellow light across the passage. Come in here, said the attendant shortly. Vansittart Smith hesitated. He had hoped that he had come to the end of his adventure, yet his curiosity was strong within him. He could not leave the matter unsolved, so he followed his strange companion into the lighted chamber. It was a small room, such as is devoted to a concierge. A wood fire sparkled in the grate. At one side stood a truckle bed and at the other a coarse wooden chair with a round table in the centre which bore the remains of a meal. As the visitor's eye glanced round, he could not but remark with an ever-recurring thrill that all the small details of the room were of the most quaint design and antique workmanship. The candlesticks, the vases upon the chimney-piece, the fire-irons, the ornaments upon the walls were all such as he had been wont to associate with the remote past. The gnarled, heavy-eyed man sat himself down upon the edge of the bed and motioned his guest into the chair. There may be design in this, he said, 
still speaking excellent English. It may be decreed that I should leave some account behind as a warning to all rash mortals who would set their wits up against workings of nature. I leave it with you. Make such use as you will of it. I speak to you now with my feet upon the threshold of the other world. I am, as you surmised, an Egyptian, not one of the downtrodden race of slaves who now inhabit the delta of the Nile, but a survivor of that fiercer and harder people who tamed the Hebrew, drove the Ethiopian back into the southern deserts, and built those mighty works which have been the envy and the wonder of all after generations. It was in the reign of Tuthmosis, sixteen hundred years before the birth of Christ, that I first saw the light. You shrink away from me. Wait, and you will see that I am more to be pitied than to be feared. My name was Sosra. My father had been the chief priest of Osiris in the great temple of Abaris, which stood in those days upon the Bubastic branch of the Nile. I was brought up in the temple and was trained in all those mystic arts which are spoken of in your own Bible. I was an apt pupil. Before I was sixteen I had learned all which the wisest priest could teach me. From that time on I studied nature's secrets for myself and shared my knowledge with no man. Of all the questions which attracted me, there were none over which I laboured so long as over those which concerned themselves with the nature of life. I probed deeply into the vital principle. The aim of medicine had been to drive away disease when it appeared. It seemed to me that a method might be devised which should so fortify the body as to prevent weakness or death from ever taking hold of it. It is useless that I should recount my researches. You would scarce comprehend them if I did. They were carried out partly upon animals, partly upon slaves, and partly on myself. Suffice it that their result was to furnish me with a substance which, when injected into the blood, would endow the body with strength to resist the effects of time, of violence, or of disease. It would not indeed confer immortality, but its potency would endure for many thousands of years. I used it upon a cat, and afterwards drugged the creature with the most deadly poisons. That cat is alive in Lower Egypt at the present moment. There was nothing of mystery or magic in the matter. It was simply a chemical discovery, which may well be made again. Love of life runs high in the young. It seemed to me that I had broken away from all human care now that I had abolished pain and driven death to such a distance. With a light heart I poured the accursed stuff into my veins. Then I looked round for someone whom I could benefit. There was a young priest of Thoth, Parmes by name, who had won my goodwill by his earnest nature and his devotion to his studies. To him I whispered my secret and at his request I injected him with my elixir. I should now, I reflected, never be without a companion of the same age as myself. After this grand discovery I relaxed my studies to some extent, but Parmes continued his with redoubled energy. Every day I could see him working with his flasks and his distiller in the Temple of Thoth, but he said little to me as to the result of his labours. For my own part, I used to walk through the city and look around me with exultation as I reflected that all this was destined to pass away, and that only I should remain. The people would bow to me as they passed me, for the fame of my knowledge had gone abroad. There was war at this time, and the great king had sent down his soldiers to the eastern boundary to drive away the Hyksos. A governor too was sent to Abaris, that he might hold it for the king. I had heard much of the beauty of the daughter of this governor, but one day, as I walked out with Parmes, we met her, borne upon the shoulders of her slaves. I was struck with love as with lightning. My heart went out from me. I could have thrown myself beneath the feet of her bearers. This was my woman. Life without her was impossible. I swore by the head of Horus that she should be mine. I swore it to the priest of Thoth. He turned away from me with a brow which was as black as midnight. There is no need to tell you of our wooing. She came to love me even as I loved her. I learned that Parmas had seen her before I did, and had shown her that he too loved her, but I could smile at his passion, for I knew that her heart was mine. The white plague had come upon the city, and many were stricken. 
but I laid my hands upon the sick and nursed them without fear or scathe. She marveled at my daring. Then I told her my secret and begged her that she would let me use my art upon her. Your flower shall then be unwithered, Atma, I said. Other things may pass away, but you and I and our great love for each other shall outlive the tomb of King Shefru. But she was full of timid, maidenly objections. Was it right? she asked. Was it not a thwarting of the will of the gods? If the great Osiris had wished that our years should be so long, would he not himself have brought it about? With fond and loving words I overcame her doubts, and yet she hesitated. It was a great question, she said. She would think it over for this one night. In the morning I should know her resolution. Surely one night was not too much to ask. She wished to pray to Isis for help in her decision. With a sinking heart and a sad foreboding of evil, I left her with her tire women. In the morning, when the early sacrifice was over, I hurried to her house. A frightened slave met me upon the steps. Her mistress was ill, she said, very ill. In a frenzy I broke my way through the attendants and rushed through hall and corridor to my Atma's chamber. She lay upon her couch, her head high upon the pillow, with a pallid face and a glazed eye. On her forehead there blazed a single angry purple patch. I knew that hell mark of old. It was the scar of the white plague, the sign manual of death. Why should I speak of that terrible time? For months I was mad, fevered, delirious, and yet I could not die. Never did an Arab thirst after the sweet wells as I longed after death. Could poison or steel have shortened the thread of my existence, I should soon have rejoined my love in the land with the narrow portal. I tried, but it was of no avail. The accursed influence was too strong upon me. One night, as I lay upon my couch, weak and weary, Parmes, the priest of Thoth, came to my chamber. He stood in the circle of the lamplight, and he looked down upon me with eyes which were bright with a mad joy. Why did you let the maiden die? he asked. Why did you not strengthen her as you strengthened me? I was too late, I answered, but I had forgot. You also loved her. You are my fellow in misfortune. Is it not terrible to think of the centuries which must pass ere we look upon her again? Fools, fools, that we were to take death to be our enemy. You may say that, he cried with a wild laugh. The words come well from your lips. For me, they have no meaning. What mean you? I cried, raising myself upon my elbow. Surely, friend, this grief has turned your brain. His face was aflame with joy, and he writhed and shook like one who hath a devil. Do you know whither I go? he asked. Nay, I answered, I cannot tell. I go to her, said he. She lies embalmed in the further tomb by the double palm tree beyond the city wall. Why do you go there? I asked. To die, he shrieked, to die. I'm not bound by earthen fetters. But the elixir is in your blood, I cried. I can defy it, said he. I have found a stronger principle which will destroy it. It is working in my veins at this moment, and in an hour I shall be a dead man. I shall join her, and you shall remain behind. As I looked upon him, I could see that he spoke words of truth. The light in his eye told me that he was indeed beyond the power of the elixir. You will teach me, I cried. Never, he answered. I implore you by the wisdom of Thoth, by the majesty of Anubis. It is useless he said coldly. Then I will find it out, I cried. You cannot, he answered. It came to me by chance. There is one ingredient which you can never get. Save that which is in the ring of Thoth, none will ever more be made. In the ring of Thoth, I repeated. Where then is the ring of Thoth? That also you shall never know, he answered. You won her love. Who has won in the end? I leave you to your sordid earth life. My chains are broken. I must go. He turned upon his heel and fled from the chamber. In the morning came the news that the priest of Thoth was dead. My days after that were spent in study. I must find this subtle poison which was strong enough to undo the elixir. 
From early dawn to midnight, I bent over the test tube and the furnace. Above all, I collected the papyri and the chemical flasks of the priest of Thoth. Alas, they taught me little. Here and there, some hint or stray expression would raise hope in my bosom, but no good ever came of it. Still, month after month, I struggled on. When my heart grew faint, I would make my way to the tomb by the palm trees. There, standing by the dead casket from which the jewel had been rifled, I would feel her sweet presence, and would whisper to her that I would rejoin her if mortal wit could solve the riddle. Palms had said that his discovery was connected with the ring of Thoth. I had some remembrance of the trinket. It was a large and weighty circlet, made not of gold, but of a rarer and heavier metal brought from the mines of Mount Harbel. Platinum, you call it. The ring had, I remembered, a hollow crystal set in it, in which some few drops of liquid might be stored. Now, the secret of palm could not have to do with the metal alone, for there were many rings of that metal in the temple. Was it not more likely that he had stored his precious poison within the cavity of the crystal? I had scarce come to this conclusion before. In hunting through his papers, I came upon one which told me that it was indeed so, and that there was still some of the liquid unused. But how to find the ring? It was not upon him when he was stripped for the embalmer. Of that I made sure. Neither was it among his private effects. In vain I searched every room that he had entered, every box and vase and chattel that he had owned. I sifted the very sand of the desert in the places where he had been wont to walk, but do what I would, I could come upon no traces of the ring of Thoth. Yet it may be that my labours would have overcome all obstacles had it not been for a new and unlooked-for misfortune. A great war had been waged against the Hyksos, and the captains of the great king had been cut off in the desert with all their bowmen and horsemen. The shepherd tribes were upon us like the locusts in a dry year. From the wilderness of Shur to the great bitter lake there was blood by day and fire by night. Abaris was the bulwark of Egypt, but we could not keep the savages back. The city fell. The governor and the soldiers were put to the sword, and I, with many more, was led away into captivity. For years and years I tended cattle in the great plains by the Euphrates. My master died, and his son grew old, but I was still as far from death as ever. At last I escaped upon a swift camel and made my way back to Egypt. The Hyksos had settled in the land which they had conquered, and their own king ruled over the country. Abaris had been torn down, the city had been burned, and of the great temple there was nothing left save an unsightly mound. Everywhere the tombs had been rifled and the monuments destroyed. Of my Atma's grave, no sign was left. It was buried in the sands of the desert, and the palm trees which marked the spot had long disappeared. The papers of palmers and the remains of the Temple of Thoth were either destroyed or scattered far and wide over the deserts of Syria. All search after them was vain. From that time I gave up all hope of ever finding the ring or discovering the subtle drug. I set myself to live as patiently as might be until the effect of the elixir should wear away. How can you understand how terrible a thing time is, you who have experience only of the narrow course which lies between the cradle and the grave? I know it to my cost, I who have floated down the whole stream of history. I was old when Ilium fell. I was very old when Herodotus came to Memphis. I was bowed down with years when the new gospel came upon earth. Yet you see me much as other men are, with the cursed elixir still sweetening my blood and guarding me against that which I would court. Now at last, at last, I have come to the end of it. I have travelled in all lands, and I have dwelt with all nations. Every tongue is the same to me. I learned them all to help pass the weary time. I need not tell you how slowly they drifted by, the long dawn of modern civilization, the dreary middle years, the dark times of barbarism. They are all behind me now. I have never looked with the eyes of love upon another woman. Atma knows that I have been constant to her. It was my custom to read all that the scholars had to say upon ancient Egypt. I have been in many positions, sometimes affluent, sometimes poor, 
but I have always found enough to enable me to buy the journals which deal with such matters. Some nine months ago I was in San Francisco, when I read an account of some discoveries made in the neighborhood of Abaris. My heart leapt into my mouth as I read it. It said that the excavator had busied himself in exploring some tombs recently unearthed. In one, there had been found an unopened mummy with an inscription upon the outer case setting forth that it contained the body of the daughter of the governor of the city in the days of Tuthmosis. It added that on removing the outer case, there had been exposed a large platinum ring set with a crystal, which had been laid upon the breast of the embalmed woman. This, then, was where Palmas had hid the ring of Thoth. He might well say that it was safe, for no Egyptian would ever stain his soul by moving even the outer case of a buried friend. That very night I set off from San Francisco, and in a few weeks I found myself once more at Abaris, if a few sand heaps and crumbling walls may retain the name of the great city. I hurried to the Frenchmen who were digging there and asked them for the ring. They replied that both the ring and the mummy had been sent to the Bulak Museum at Cairo. To Bulak I went, but only to be told that Mariette Bay had claimed them and had shipped them to the Louvre. I followed them, and there at last, in the Egyptian chamber, I came, after close upon four thousand years, upon the remains of my Atma, and upon the ring for which I had sought so long. But how was I to lay hands upon them? How was I to have them for my very own? It chanced that the office of attendant was vacant. I went to the director. I convinced him that I knew much about Egypt. In my eagerness, I said too much. He remarked that a professor's chair would suit me better than a seat in the conciergerie. I knew more, he said, than he did. It was only by blundering and letting him think that he had overestimated my knowledge that I prevailed upon him to let me move the few effects which I have retained into this chamber. It is my first and my last night here. Such is my story, Mr. Vansittart Smith. I need not say more to a man of your perception. By a strange chance you have this night looked upon the face of the woman whom I loved in those far-off days. There were many rings with crystals in the case, and I had to test for the platinum to be sure of the one which I wanted. A glance at the crystal has shown me that the liquid is indeed within it, and that I shall at last be able to shake off that accursed health which has been worse to me than the foulest disease. I have nothing more to say to you. I have unburdened myself. You may tell my story, or you may withhold it at your pleasure. The choice rests with you. I owe you some amends, for you have had a narrow escape of your life this night. I was a desperate man, and not to be balked in my purpose. Had I seen you before the thing was done, I might have put it beyond your power to oppose me or to raise an alarm. This is the door. It leads into the Rue de Rivoli. Good night. The Englishman glanced back. For a moment, the lean figure of Sosra the Egyptian stood framed in the narrow doorway. The next, the door had slammed, and the heavy rasping of a bolt broke on the silent night. It was on the second day after his return to London that Mr. John Vansittart Smith saw the following concise narrative in the Paris correspondence of the Times. Curious occurrence in the Louvre. Yesterday morning, a strange discovery was made in the principal Egyptian chamber. The ouvriers who are employed to clean out the rooms in the morning found one of the attendants lying dead upon the floor with his arms round one of the mummies. So close was his embrace that it was only with the utmost difficulty that they were separated. One of the cases containing valuable rings had been opened and rifled. The authorities are of opinion that the man was bearing away the mummy with some idea of selling it to a private collector, but that he was struck down in the very act by long-standing disease of the heart. It is said that he was a man of uncertain age and eccentric habits, without any living relations to mourn over his dramatic and untimely end.